household, though the names of Hequanic's properties are recorded in his correspondence, there is no indication of where many of them are to be found on the map of modern Egypt. Most scholars have assumed, as the letters were found at Thebes, that the farmer priest had been a southerner and that his major land holdings and home had been close by, that some of the letters invoked the northern gods of Memphis in Heracleopolis, they presumed, was because Hequanic had written them at Memphis or at the newly established court of Ejtoi. James Allen. However, the papyri's latest editor detected a northern accent in Hequanic's writings and has suggested that his farmstead was close to Memphis and Ejtoi. The letters and accounts, he considers, were composed at Thebes whilst Hequanic was attempting to control his family business in the north at the same time that he was undertaking his duties in the south at Ipe's tomb, ministering daily to the vizier's cult, and ensuring his continued presence in the Theban temples on days of feasting and festival. By pharaonic standards the letters in Hequanic's own hand are very long, whereas translations of the majority of pharaonic letters that have survived may be rendered in translation in 300 words or less, some of Hequanics run to 800, one to more than 1,000. The longest of all is addressed to one Mursu, his estate manager and probably a son, who was in charge of Hequanics' household in his absence. First, the letter deals with the business of the home farm, then with household problems. When Hequanic writes to his mother, on the other hand, he deals primarily with his household. Twelve senior members of his extended family grouping are identified by name, as well as Mursu and his mother, Ipe. There are people that modern translators conventionally describe as aunts and sisters, as brothers, sons and daughters as, well as a woman who is variously described as Hequanic's new bride, or concubine, according to the taste of the translator, with the exception of a cattle herder and a farm manager, the people. He continually names in the correspondence appear to be members of this intimate household, and he is especially affectionate towards his mother dash greet my mother IP, a thousand times, a million times. He also worries indulgently about a son named Sneferu dash there is nothing more important than him dash and scolds various members of his household for the manner in which they have treated his new bride. Now, what about this evil treatment? You go too far. Time and again. However, his concern extends beyond the circle that the modern world would describe as his immediate family. All the people of my household, he writes, are the same as my children. A household, we glimpse, that included sharecropping farmers who were living on his land. So, though governing with what might now seem to be a stern, Assurance in a harsh tongue, the letters also show the farmer priest engaged in caring for and controlling a self-sufficient farming community in which all its various members had a place at table. Whilst the eight papyri provide a brilliant snapshot of lives lived in pharaonic state on a far smaller scale than that at the pharaonic residence, they also show that the structure of Hequanic's domain is essentially the same as that of the households of pharaoh and his courtiers. Indeed, the farmer's household has the same hierarchy and its members are involved in the same daily activities as those portrayed in the scenes within the nobles' tomb chapels and in the splendid models that Wenlock found within the tomb of Maketri. Yet none of Hequanic's documents give an indication of his role or position in the pharaonic state, and there is no mention of the king or of the courtier. Was his position of funerary priest an obligatory inheritance? Was his household typical of many others? Was he buried in one of the heavy, mostly anonymous wooden coffins of the period that have been found in their hundreds along the valley of the lower Nile? Or was he, alternatively, interred in a manner similar to the owners of many of the splendid provincial tombs of those same times, men whose titles suggest that they had played but modest roles in the pharaonic administrations? yet had commanded sufficient resources to make fine monuments in the pharaonic manner. For as the fragmentary accounts found beside the tomb of Maquette reserved to underline 
the creation of such splendid monuments had required the labors of relatively small gangs of workers and for limited periods of time within this wider picture therefore hequanic remains a mystery as with letters of all ages both the senders and their recipients took their common world for granted and never for a moment thought it to be in need of explanation so the context of many of the people and places the farmer priest so vigorously conjures is similarly mysterious so there is no indication of the number of people who lived within the orbit of hequanic's household nor whether or not the loans and rations list of his accounts were provided to subsidiary households or to individuals once again we come up against the common truth of ancient history with an overall population in hequanic's day that is estimated at less than two million souls most of his contemporaries have left no trace and are not represented in the cemeteries or the desert settlements that have been excavated in common with the farmer priest hequanic himself beyond those eight fragile papyri they have all completely disappeared what remains however both from hequanic's small archive and from all the other surviving relics of his age is the fundamental order of pharaonic culture like hequanic's the households of the kings and courtiers were composed of a key senior group operating under a paterfamilias a king a nobleman a local landowner quite unrelated to that central group as can other members of the household might work as scribes or managers priests and courtiers as shepherds farm workers or house servants in boatyards and in craftsmen's workshops making monuments and tombs Hequanic's household, of course, was not filled with such professionals, with many of its members working directly on the land. His family might well be described as subsistence farmers, yet his literacy and bookkeeping, the means and methods of his correspondence, and his interests right across the kingdom were all enabled by the machinery of the state. His use of copper, for example, whose extraction was beyond the resources of a private household, shows how the produce of the state had circulated throughout the kingdom, and Hequanic had traveled as widely as the courtiers. Some 14 place names are mentioned in Hequanic's accounts, and though the locations of many of them are unknown the span of scholarly, opinion places them close to the centers of Thebes, Abydus and Memphis. So, from his dealings with the living to his work at Deir el-Bahari serving the courtly dead, the order and the culture of the Pharaonic kingdom had dominated the farmer priest's life. It had, indeed, enabled his existence. 24. The Materials of State The Court at Work Copper, the Mines of Sinai Many of the materials that sanctified and empowered the core activities of Pharaonic culture were formed to the valley of the Lower Nile. From its beginnings, Pharaoh's Egypt had required coniferous timber for its coffins, boats and barges, exotic oils and incense for its temples and its dead, gold and hard stone, gems and copper from the surrounding deserts and ebony, ivory and exotic pelts from the south. So to reinstate the essence of that ancient order the officers of the new-made court had to travel north and south, east and west, reopening mines and quarries outside the region of the lower nile and retracing the routes by which the other essential ingredients of the courtly culture could be brought into the kingdom once again the single essential element was copper copper tools had shaped the pyramids enabled the construction of state boats and barges and cut the fine relief within the tomb chapels and temples of giza abusir and Zakara and all the other works of Memphi craftsmen. The better part of it had been obtained from the Levant for mines and furnaces on the peninsula of Sinai. If the scale of importation of copper from the Levant had been considerable, the output of the Sinai mines was and would again become enormous. The remaining slag heaps in the Wadi Nasp alone, a single volley in southwestern Sinai, have been estimated at 100,000 tons and stretch for miles along the valley's sides. They are the product of some 3,000 furnaces, modest freestone structures made up of rows of fire, boxes, 
each one some three to four feet long and two feet high, cited. With such subtlety that with the use of imported fuel and the aid of the prevailing winds they had easily attained the necessary temperatures dash. 1,250 degrees Celsius slash 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, required to render that region's high-quality ores into slag and copper. Dramatic evidence of the reopening of the Sinai copper mines in the times of the Montuoteps and their subsequent enlargement under the Itch Toei Kings was discovered in the 1990s at the modern resort of Ain. Sukna on the Red Sea coast, where from the time of Kafra onwards, the court of the Memphite pharaohs had operated a sizable port. From the first generations of the new kingdom, the man-made caves that had been excavated in Memphite times to serve as magazines and chandleries were reopened and put to use again. Numerous inscriptions and graffiti at the site record the return of these state mining expeditions, some of them led by high officials such as the treasurer I.P., who had succeeded Maquette Re and who would later attain the title of vizier at the court of Ijtoi, the most ancient of these texts. Though given the considerable building projects of his predecessors this was certainly not the first copper mining expedition that the Theban court had sent to the southern Sinai, bears the name of the last Montuotep, numbered four. Here, however, Beneath the name and image of that ruler, a brief text records the vague logistics of an expedition that had been mounted shortly after his accession to the throne at a time, presumably, when the court was in need of large quantities of copper for the new king's funerary monuments, just as many desert inscriptions. Underline. While serving as it had in earlier centuries as a base for expeditions into southern Sinai, the port at Ang Sukna also had its own copper mining and smelting industry, an undertaking that the numerous expeditions of the Ijtoi kings would enlarge and improve, for the lines of copper furnaces of those times that still stand beside the port are larger and more efficient than those of Sinai, before the construction of a hotel complex in the modern coastal road, the isolated ancient site at Ain Sukna, with its chandleries, its warehouses, its furnaces and all its other facilities, had lain undetected, and remarkably intact beneath the wind-blown sand, like those of Sinai. The furnaces of Ain Sukna had been set along the sides of a small desert wadi. Here, though, the archaeologists were able to establish the ancient methods of working in such detail that they were able to replicate the processes of smelting, which had first reduced the copper, ores, and the secondary processes in which the resulting mix of slag and copper globules had been crushed, sorted and reheated in little crucibles, by gangs of workers using ceramic-tipped blowpipes, a technique so simple yet so efficient that the resulting liquid metal could be cast in small ingots of remarkably pure metal, except for water and some copper ore, which may have been mined. Locally, Virtually all the provisions and materials used at Ain Sukna were transported to that desolate location from the region of the lower Nile. This was a considerable undertaking. It has been calculated, for example, that for the reduction and refinement of copper are four times. The weight of the resulting copper would have been required in fuel. Analysis of the surviving charcoal from Ain Sukna's desert furnaces shows that the wood which they consumed had been transported from Nau Valley. The archaeologists also excavated bread ovens, some slaughterhouses and two dismantled seagoing boats still lying in the rock-cut magazines, all neatly stacked with their planks tied up in bundles. Here, too, a large pit was uncovered, whose distinctive shape, along with the numerous post holes set all around it, suggested that Pharaoh shipbuilders had used it as a form in which dismantled boats brought piecemeal from the Nile side shipyards could be accurately and easily reassembled. To the modern eye, the sprawling site is what one of its archaeologists, Pierre Tallet, has described as a pre industrial appearance. Ain Sukhna was certainly a vital crossroad in the procurement of some of the materials required to make the monuments of the refounded kingdom. It was an entrepot of the Ij Toi court that had received fuel and provisions, craftsmen, miners in the dismantled 
Timbers of Byblus boats from the regions of the Lower Nile and Copper. From Sinai, where mining had been resumed at a similar pace to that of the times of the later Memphite kings. The best part of Sinai's ancient copper mines lie in the zone between the plateau of central Sinai and the wadis which run westwards from the high plain down to the coastal plain of El Marca where the Memphite court had established a caravanserai in port. It is a much faulted and eroded landscape of jagged hills, mountains and wadis that appears, when seen from space, to resemble the height of an old rhinoceros. Sinai's copper ores were formed by the same high-pressured processes that had created the beds of sandstone and granite underlying the limestones of the Nile Valley, and later, the bad lands of southwestern. Sinai were eroded and shaped by the same diluvial rains as those that cut the valley of the Nile, the crystallization of its rust-red copper ores, encouraging the formation of telltale streaks of oxides and bright green. Malachite that would signal to Pharaoh's prospectors were the richest. Deposits were to be found, when the copper of those ores had mixed. With other metals, alternatively, gemstones were occasionally created in those same processes, producing in the case of Sinai a characteristic blue-green turquoise, a high-shining stone that had been used by the craftsmen of the Lower Nile long before the times of the first pharaohs. In consequence, perhaps, of the appearance of this fine stone in Sinai's dun-red sandstone cliffs, the region of the copper mines was awarded the somewhat misleading pharaonic name of the terraces of turquoise, the gemstone standing, it appears, as a courtly emblem of pharaonic interest and activity in those desolate mountains. Yet, although turquoise was a royal stone in the ancient miners' tunnels which trace its glittering, seams may still be seen in Sinai the prime target in that region's extensive exploitation by the officials of the pharaonic court was copper. Or, an off-road journey through these mountainous regions is still very hard, in the manner of his times, a scholar of the 1930s remarked that it was only possible with a considerable supply of food, camels and Arabs. The area is so large and so intractable, so dense with ancient mines, so laced with trackways in the ruins of antique settlements, that almost every new survey of the region uncovered inscriptions, huts and workings that were previously unknown. The center of those millennial activities was the Wadi Magara, the Valley of Caves. Here it was that the ancient mining expeditions cut the largest number of mine shafts, and, since the times when stone blocks were first used as building materials, Millennia of court sculptors had engraved royal car touches and unique and complex courtly scenes upon the glowering cliffs, here as well as an extraordinarily diverse range of more modest engravings, texts and images recording the names and titles, invocations and images of expedition personnel from viziers to scorpion repellers, from miners to court treasurers, many of whose names and titles also appear across the sea on the rocks of Ain Sukhna. Walls and huts built in the times of the Ishtoi pharaohs run along the bottom of Wadi Magara, and ancient trackways twist and turn above them to heights of 500 feet and more. Picks, pounders, walls and grinding stones lay all around the workings in the mining settlements. Large numbers of beautiful globular storage jars from the workshops of the Ishtoi potters were buried in the floors of some of these ancient Dwellings in the belief, it may be imagined, that the miners would return. In sense, high Sahara. To modern mines, and in comparison to such fundamental materials as stone and copper, the perfumed smoke of burning incense might seem superfluous to the burgeoning needs of a newly refounded state. Yet, nor is the unflinching determination of the ancient court to obtain the traditional ingredients of court life more dramatically epitomized than at a recently discovered rock inscription in the western desert, at a location far beyond all previously recorded evidence of ancient Egyptian penetration of the Sahara, at that lonely point on modern maps where a dotted nexus of colonial cartography marks out the modern borders of Libya, Egypt and the Sudan, determined by British imperial surveyors and confirmed during the 1920s.
infamous Berlin Conference of 1884-5, this remote convergence is marked by the mountainous outcrop of the Gable Uenot, a mysterious ring-shaped granite crust some 15 miles across, with sandstone plateaus running off its eastern slopes that have been cut into deep valleys and are yet watered by desert springs. Other than a handful of border guards, no one now lives in this isolated region. It is so remote, indeed, that its splendid prehistoric rock drawings, memorials, perhaps, of Neolithic transhumans, went unnoticed until the 1920s, and the pharaonic images and texts accompanied by a grand cartouche of Montuo Tep II were not discovered until 2008. Expertly drawn and lightly pecked into the golden surface of a sandstone boulder lying on a rocky slope, this remarkable inscription is set beside a drawing of Montuo Tep II and thrown beneath a royal canopy. Two groups of fine made hieroglyphs face this regal image. The upper text tells that the people of Yem are bringing balls of incense to the royal audience, the lower that the inhabitants of Tekhibit, who are announced by a splendid hieroglyph of a desert oryx, are presenting Montuotep with something whose name has long since been eroded by the wind, set between the seated king and those two groups of text, a large cartouche spells out the royal name in somewhat modest hieroglyphs, as if to emphasize that the court scribes of the pharaoh, Montuotep, son of Re for whom the great temple of Deir el-Bahari had been constructed, had also journeyed into distant deserts. No further evidence of pharaonic caravans has been found upon the Gable Uenot, nor in any other such far-flung locations. 400 miles to the north and east, however, at Dakla Oasis, inscriptions made. A few generations later record that a certain Mary, a steward of the Ijtoi kings, had set out to find the people of the oasis. These texts appear to stand as signposts to the Abu Balas Trail, along which the caravans of the Memphite pharaohs had established depots of grain and water pots. So the discovery of Montuotep's name at Gable Uenot, which is a grand extension of the direction of the Abu Balas Trail, suggests that the enigmatic groups of signs known now as water Mountains that were engraved in the times of the Giza kings at two. Locations close to the Abu Balas Trail may represent the crags and cascades of the Gable Uenot, whose name, indeed, is Arabic for the Mountain of Little Springs. Perhaps those gallant ancient travelers had met the people of the desert at the Gable Uenot. There are, however, literary indications that they may have journeyed even further south across the desert, too. Lake Chad an epic caravans whose adventures came to serve other somewhat unexpected functions in the provision of courtly raw materials for the physical realities of such heroic journeys through the Sahara to an enormous desert lake some ten times larger than it is today, with marshy shorelines, trees, Russian pythons, crocodiles and baboons, hippopotami and immeasurable quantities of fish and birds, may have entered the pharaonic consciousness in ways that modern travelers with GPS technologies and four-wheel drives cannot easily imagine. For those, same landscapes seem to have formed the perimeters of a worldview that was inhabited by both the living and the dead, landscapes that are described in the funerary texts within the Memphite pyramids and also in funerary monuments of the times of the Ishtoi kings, and in later ages, when the court scribes were engrossed in creating detailed literary explorations of the geographies of life and death, memories of those same epic journeys, those same landscapes, were elaborated and enlarged in the high desert, amongst the quietness of the rock and sand in the ever-present sense that you are literally standing at the edge of life. Those half-recollected visions of the distant reed beds of a sparkling lake appear to have loomed in the pharaonic imagination, and in the times of the reviving kingdom, royal caravans and boats were revisiting the edges of that ancient Memphite universe to obtain the traditional ingredients that enabled the theaters in which the king and his appointed priests called ritually commune with other worlds, and with every trip outside the region of the lower Nile, with each voyage and each caravan, the
Edges of that ancient universe were revisited and touched again. And, thus confirmed, that ancient universe revived. The Wonderful Things of Punt In the 1830s two pioneering Egyptologists, traveling in separate camel caravans through Egypt's mountainous eastern deserts on their way to the Red Sea coast, found two steely by a remote ancient well. Both were engraved with the courtly images and hieroglyphs of the time of the Ijtoi kings. After offering praise to Amenivit II, who sat upon the throne of Horus and was beloved of the god of Coptus, the text of one of these fine works named a ship's captain, Kentiware, whose boats had returned in safety to the port of Sayu after a voyage to the land of Punt, two locations that in the 1830s were completely unknown. The text upon the other cell recorded parts of the core career of the son of a provincial governor, one Kanumhotep who grew up in the royal residence under the instruction of the king, who served as superintendent of the royal audience chamber and who ended his long career at court, as other sources tell, as the vizier of Senmosra III. Like Captain Kentiware, Knumhotep had long connections with places outside the lower valley of the Nile. Even as a young man he had appeared on the walls of his father's splendid tomb chapel on the cliff. Cemetery known as Beni Hassan in Middle Egypt, in a register that shows him bringing a group of brightly dressed foreigners into his father's presence. This is a much celebrated scene that 19th century reverends mistook for images of Joseph and his king coming down to Egypt, but which in reality shows a Levantine caravan carrying bags of coal, a powder widely used as a pigment of black eye paint, which they had brought from the Galena mines in the eastern desert. In the 1970s, an Egyptian archaeological expedition returned to the desolate Red Sea coast close to the wadi where the stele of Kentiware and Kamhotep were found. There, at the mouth of the wadi Galusis, on a low ridge overlooking the modest bay that was rarely visited by Arab dows, they discovered further traces of the ancient port of Sayu. For on that low ridge, a half mile from the sea, Abdul Monam Said and his team excavated some forty inscribed potsherds, fragments of the records of the provisions, fish and figs, dates, meat, grain and beer, of an expedition which had been dispatched and supplied from Ijtoi during the reign of Senwajra III, a mission, so the text described, that had been led by a certain Nebuchadnezzar, a court official who had overseen a staff of stewards, scribes and priests that had controlled the expedition. Two fine stele were also uncovered on that low ridge, the memorials of another expedition that had been undertaken in the 24th year of the reign of Senwajrat I and had been led by Antifoker, a much-documented vizier of those times. The stele described two different stages of the expedition. The first, on terra firma, concerned its preparation in the Nile Valley in the journey to the Red Sea coast which had been overseen by an official named Amini, who also appears in the records of other desert expeditions of the times. The expedition's second leg had consisted of a sea voyage to the land of Punt that was led by a certain Ankau. Both steely were still standing in their original positions facing the sea and both were framed and supported by wedge-shaped blocks of stone which, Said suggested, had served as the anchors of Ankau's boats. In the absence of any firm archaeological evidence of an ancient port in the vicinity, however, in a pithy academic dispute concerning the true function of the so-called anchor stones stemming from the ambiguous and often fragmentary nature of the hieroglyphic sides, remarkable discoveries failed to convince traditional scholars that he had found the port of Sayu, for they had long since doubted that the Ancient Egyptians had been adventurous enough to sail the rough waters of the Rhea Sea or that a desert beach that was 150 miles from the Nile could have served as a fair onyx seaport, and in the 1990s that view was bolstered by a coastline survey of the area by a team of divers who failed to find any offshore underwater evidence of an ancient harbor. Nonetheless, the shapes of some of the ancient planks and beams that Said and his team had excavated were identified as the timbers of fair onic boats, and in 2001 a joint expedition from Boston and Naples.
universities, led by Catherine Bard and Rodolfo Fatovich, gathered a multinational team of archaeologists, archaeogeologists, paleobiologists and geophysicists to conduct a thorough survey of the area dot and they uncovered unequivocal evidence that a Red Sea port had been in operation at the mouth of the Wadi Gawasis in the times of the Ichtoi kings. The true purpose of those contentious anchor stones was quickly resolved, similar to others that have been found in harbors by the Red Sea in the Mediterranean, the two distinctive chamfered holes and many of those stones had accommodated seagoing cables, one that had held the rope by which the anchor had been pulled sideways to disengage it from soft sea mud whilst the other had accommodated the rope by which the anchor had been lowered and lifted into the water. The ancient harbor had been invisible to earlier travelers and archaeologists because it had been first choked and then entirely buried deep in desert sand, which had blown down along the Wadi Gullises from the eastern desert more than a thousand years before. In Pharaonic times, the desert ridge where Said had found the Ostrasa and Steely had stood at the mouth of a large lagoon fringed with mangrove swamps, and the ancient harbor had lain within that lost lagoon, half a mile inland from the modern shoreline. The rare fragments of pottery showed that the waterfront had been used in old kingdom times, in quantities of shells mixed with Prehistoric tools of flint suggested yet earlier indigenous occupations. Numerous inscriptions in the vast majority of the surviving ceramics show that it had been most heavily occupied in the times of the Ijtoi kings. Yet the harbor installations had been transient affairs, the accommodations of expeditions mounted at five and ten year intervals. By the Ijtoi court, the ancient sailors, the archaeologists discovered, had camped upon a beach that presently lies inland but which in pharaonic times had also held the slipways of their boats. Here there are covered the scant remains of huts and tents and cooking fires and the remains of some of the fish bones, mostly sea bream and colorful red sea parrot fish, that the ancient expeditions had caught and cooked. Here, two of the bones of donkeys, presumably those of some of the pack. Animals which had brought the sailors and their supplies through the desert to that lonely place, above the beach and set up on another coral reef, the archaeologists uncovered traces of similarly light structures that had provided accommodations for some fifty people who, so the fragments of their pottery showed, appeared to have been of Nubian culture. Like some of the inhabitants of Gebelin and Ang Tiffy's time, this group may have served the expeditions as guards in a militia, whilst the ostracism found by Said's team in the text of Antifoker Stelme also suggests that Nubians had taken part in the sea voyages. More than 30 small limestone stelae have been recovered in these ongoing excavations. All of them are cut from Nile Valley limestone and some are uninscribed, in anticipation, it appears, of a successful voyage and a subsequent celebratory inscription that would have been engraved within the port. In common with the writings that describe other pharaonic expeditions, the texts on some of the stelae are out of the ordinary, some unique. A few praise the godmen of Coptus, the Nile side. Settlement from which the overland stage of some of these expeditions appears to have begun, one holds a unique epithet of the god Amun. Amun of the sea. Most of the Ijtoi pharaohs are named in these seaside texts and they show that their courts had sent expeditions from the port of Sayu to the land of Punt throughout successive reigns. The niches carved for the accommodation of these small steely show that they had been destined to be set in the lower terraces of coral, beside the harbor and the lost lagoon. Others, however, grander. Monuments like those of Ankau and Antifoker had been set up above. Then on a higher coral terrace, and on the terraces beside the ancient Entrance to the lagoon, above the harbor installations, the sailors had marked the location of their home port on the coastline in the manner of a lighthouse, notching the low flat horizon with a series of mounds and pavements and shrines, made of local stone and fossil corals. At least one of those shrines had been roofed with mangrove branches. Inside, the archaeologists found 700 conch shells, this, perhaps, 
either evidence of. Offerings are an ancient example of a custom of modern-day Red Sea fishermen, who still embed such shells in the walls of their seaside. Shelters. As at the other pharaonic Red Sea ports, the people at the port of Saluhad poured a series of long deep cave-like magazines into the terraces above the ancient beach. One of them yet holds heaps of ship. Cables lying in tidy heaps upon the floor, thirty perfectly bundled coils of thick rope, each one between sixty and a hundred feet long and made, in the manner of the pyramid builders, from the stems of Nile papyrus. Plants. Desiccated fragments of sycamore figs, garlic, snails and crabs, bulgur. Barley and other grains lay in and around some of the magazines, along with the shells of weevils that had eaten part of those stores as they lay. Within the darkness of the caves, nearby lay the stone corns on which the imported Nile wheat had been ground into flour in the ovens and molds in which the people had baked their bread. Here, too, were found stacks of evenly sized dishes especially designed, so it appears, too. Hold a sailor's ration, and more scribal ostraso were found within this camp, along with wooden labels and fragments of the seal impressions of types used by the expedition scribes to seal everything from letters and ceramic storage jars to warehouses. Some of these stamped impressions named individuals, other settlements such as Thebes and Inchtoi. A single fine green seal stamp appeared to have been dropped and lost by its ancient owner and was found lying where it had fallen on the ancient strand. Four large and simple huts made of mud brick and mangrove poles had been built by the harbor slipways and, as the quantities of shavings, fragments of wood and tools suggest, appear to have served as workshops for the boat makers. Here, then, the timbers of seagoing boats that had been brought piecemeal from the Nile would have been assembled for the voyage. At the same time, shells of shark barnacles in the area showed that the shipwrights had also repaired working boats. And, as the fragments of rotted planks studded with barnacles and riddled with the boreholes of various shipworms vividly testified, they had service vessels which had spent long months at sea. The archaeologists also excavated a considerable assortment of ninety-odd ships' timbers in that same area, which, apart from the occasional Use of softer local mangrove wood had all been cut from imported wood. Some of these were sections of the huge cedar bulks of the long keels that were the spines of fair onic boats. There was as well an assortment of the distinctive individually shaped planks from the decks and hulls of those same craft, timbers so strong and thick that the vessels for which they had been shaped and fitted had not required supporting ribs or transoms. Like those found in the other Red Sea chandleries, these timbers had been carried in donkey caravans from the Nile Valley through the mountains of the eastern desert to that desolate coast along with the heavy coiled ropes, the ship's sails, the steely, the pottery, the provisions, and equipment of the sailors, carpenters and militia, the scribes, the foremen and the expedition's leaders. Some rare fragmentary papyri of the times of the Ishtoi kings tell that at least two state-operated Nile-side boatyards were operating in those times, one at the settlements of Coptis, the other close to Thinnis. By Abidus, information that was confirmed by part of the text on the Stella of Antifoker. Then, as the accompanying Stella describes, Ankau and his brave flotilla, its cargoes, its crews and its militia had sailed from the port of Saw you to the land of Punt. Two fourteen-foot-long steering oars found in the deep sand of the ancient harbor suggests that these reassembled boats had been at least sixty-five feet long, with a crew of thirty oarsmen in a square rigged sail set at the center of its elegantly shaped hull, a recent reproduction of. Just such a vessel by a team led by Cheryl Ward has a displacement of thirty tons in a cargo capacity of more than half that weight. This Reconstruction further demonstrated that these Biblis boats were thoroughly suited to sea voyages, though, as in so many other aspects of ancient life, its modern sailors had to adapt to methods of sailing that were quite foreign to them. Sea trials conducted during the winter of 1890-91
2008 to 9 confirmed that Biblis boats could have comfortably managed the 10 foot swells along the Red Sea coast and, given the right conditions, would have sailed at some 9 knots. Where then, exactly? On what seas, had these ancient boats once sailed to arrive at the enigmatic land of Punt? Amongst the thousands of ceramic sherds found at Wadi Gawas's dash, mostly from domestic wares and large storage jars, either roughly made locally or carefully potted from Nile Valley clays, the archaeologists also recovered fragments of contemporary pottery from Crete and Aden, from Ethiopia and Eritrea, from the Yemen and the Levant, the port of Sayu, therefore, had links with the central trade routes of the ancient Eastern world, just as Pharaoh's Red Sea fleets were mostly built of cedar, oak and pine from the eastern Mediterranean, so some of the people who had sailed from Sayu may have also been Levantines or, as some of the pottery and texts found at Sayu might suggest, some of Pharaoh's sailors were Nubian or Ethiopian or may, indeed, have hailed from the land of Punt. Seen in this light, the port of Sayu appears as a Note in a far wider and more ancient Bronze Age circuit of travel and exchange, a temporary port established by the Ijtoi court to enable it to rejoin more ancient networks in its search for courtly goods. Pharaonic texts of different ages describe journeys to the land of Punt, by land and sea and even by lengthy voyages up the Nile. Certainly, it had lain to the south of Egypt, for most of the produce of Punt named in Pharaonic texts. Aromatic gums and resins such as frankincense and myrrh, ebony, ivory, leopard skins, baboons and monkeys and even, perhaps, people like the pygmy that Harkhoof brought to the court of the young King Pepe I, were typical of tropical Africa. Although the earliest known records of pharaonic expeditions to Punt are the voyages whose exotic cargoes are pictured on the walls of the temples of Abu Sir, the presence of such materials within the valley of the Lower Nile is very ancient, and they had been in prominent use at the Pharaonic court from its beginnings. Though slight, perhaps, it appears to have been a fairly constant traffic in Pharaonic times and, indeed, reciprocal, purportable Pharaonic objects of various ages have been excavated at Kosala in East Sudan, in the Barka Valley, at Adulis in Eritrea, and in Somalia and Kenya. Four carbonized rods of ebony found in one of the poor shrines at Wadi Gaussis had probably been burned in offerings, along with other African timbers that the carpenters at Sayu had occasionally used. Ebony, a dark and precious wood used for courtly furnishings and temple fittings, grew right across the tropics, deepening those botanical connections, a recent DNA analysis of mummified baboons, which had been imported as live animals into pharaonic Egypt from the land of Punt, suggests that they had either been captured in the upper reaches of the Nile or in the regions to the east of that river. A few of the fragments of pottery found at Soyu, moreover, are similar to those made at the port of Adulis in the Gulf of Zula, a thousand miles south along the coast of Africa, was this, perhaps, a port that served as an entrepot to mythic. Punt? Based on pharaonic texts, various theories have placed the land of Punt in such specific modern locations as East Sudan, the hinterlands of the Ethiopian and Sudanese lowlands in the Horn of Africa. The presence of ceramics from Aden and Yemen at Wadi Gaussis has also suggested South Arabia, not as the source of Punt's exotic goods but as a place of contact where such African goods had been obtained. Nor Certainly, was the Red Sea the main route of pharaonic interconnection with the south, the deserts of the upper Nile, that most ancient highway, are crisscrossed by ancient tracks connecting the Ethiopian Eritrean highlands to adjoining regions north and south, seashells, for example, are commonly found in ancient graves in East Sudan, rather than a single fixed location, therefore, the land of Puntme have sometimes served as a generic term for the origins of exotic southern produce and may have shifted in its usage in other ways over the millennia, for ancient people did not possess the mindset of modern mapmakers. Nonetheless, 
buried deep within the sand that had obliterated the ancient lagoon of Sayu. The archaeologists uncovered forty cream painted near identical wooden boxes, laid out in careful lines in front of the rock cut chandleries. Though similar to a few boxes that have been found in contemporary settlements within the valley of the Nile, at the port of Sayu, these well proportioned chests had not served as household furniture but as storage units on Pharaoh's boats. For in one of those rare moments in archaeology where the physical remnants of the past are touched directly by the information held in formal court inscriptions, one of those boxes was found to have a cartouche of a mini bit four inked upon its side, along with an accompanying description telling that it had once held the wonderful things of Punt. Voyages from Sayu to Punt were ponderous and complex undertakings. Preliminary trips both on the Nile and on the Mediterranean were required to obtain the ship's timbers. Copper was needed for the tools that shaped them, fashioned in Nile-side boat yards. Those vessels were then transported in sections through the eastern mountains along desert wadis to the shore of the Red Sea, considerable journeys that sometimes required the excavation of fresh wells in the desert. Once at the port of Sayu, teams of carpenters from Nile side. Shipyards had reassembled the boats by the lagoon. Then the little squadron had set out, sailing south along the coast for what, the boats. Timbers tell, had been substantial voyages to meet the peoples whose goods they so prized, before returning, as the prevailing winds and tides still indicate, along the Arabian coast and finally tacking briefly across the rough Red Sea to Sayu. There, the ship's cargo boxes would have been emptied and their exotic treasures loaded into donkey painters for the trek back through the mountains to the gentle river and there. Eventual distribution to the storerooms of the temples and the royal residence. And at the port of Sayu in that same period of time, the Biblis boats would either have been refitted for further voyages or dismantled and taken in caravan along with the wonderful things of punt back into the valley of the Nile for other journeys, perhaps, along the seaboard of the eastern Mediterranean. Such complicated expeditions would have been as costly in state, provisions and materials as the construction of stone monuments. Ultimately, they had served the same purpose, just as the dramas of the daily rites and offerings, the regular contact and communication with Deity and the dead, took place in temples and tomb chapels whose Construction was a main activity of government, so contact and communication with deity and the dead within those monuments had required goods obtained from distant destinations, incense, perfumed, oils and purifying salts, priestly furs and gold, ebony and ivory were as vital to the tasks of ritual and offering as were the stone and copper needed to construct the theaters in which those interactions took place rather than assuming in the traditional manner that the pharaohs had possessed the modern desire for fine consumer goods and displays of wealth and power, we see the officials of the ancient Memphite culture gripped by the need to obtain the necessary ingredients of court life, as their monuments and texts imply, that same urge had constantly inspired the court of the Intefs, the Montuoteps and their successors at Ijtoi, and their drive to reunite the ancient kingdom, so that the pharaonic culture of the lower Nile would be set in motion once again, and Pharaoh and all his people, both the living and the dead, might regain their place at the center of an ordered universe, just as the verses of a famed papyrus text still tell, carnelian, amethyst and siltstone, the Egyptian deserts. Egypt's oldest rocks, its so-called crystalline basement, lie underneath the Sinai Mountains in the high cliffs of the lower Nile Valley, partially appended in ages long before the Nile had flowed into the Mediterranean. They are exposed at the Aswan Cataract and in the bad lands of the upper Egyptian deserts. Some of the most splendid stones in this desert jewel box had been quarried and collected since prehistoric times, and in the days of Khafra and Menkori the court jewelers had worked. Gemstones from those rich deposits in the sculptor's workshops had used its glistening rocks for major works of sculpture. It was to be expected, therefore, 
that the courts of the refounded kingdom of Ijjoi would revisit, reopen and rework those ancient desert quarries. So, once again, pharaonic caravans had traveled into the deep Sahara. South of Aswan, along the 50 miles of desert track laid down in the times of the Memphite kings that led to the so-called Hefren quarries of the Gable El Asr, and set up new huts and storerooms. Just as the earlier pharaonic expeditions to those quarries had been but short-term enterprises so the accommodations that the Ijtoi quarrymen built are simple huts whose dry stone walls are made from fragments of the hard stone that their predecessors had split with fire and wedges and scattered all across the sand as they extracted flawless boulders from the wondrous matrix, igneous and metamorphic, that lay beneath their feet. In one of the largest of these huts, archaeologists recently uncovered long lines of handsome globular storage jars made in the times of the Ijtoi kings. Exactly the same type of vessel has been found in most of the sites at which that court had lived and worked. Each of those vessels could carry a hundred pounds of wheat. Here then, once again, bread was baked in desert ovens, the charcoal brought on donkey back, the flour ground on site on local stone and mixed with water taken from nearby wells tapping directly into prehistoric aquifers. The sprawling stone workings on the gable L A S R do not resemble modern quarries, loosely covered by windborne sand, the hard stone. Strata were easily located and they were quarried in some 600 different locations over a six-mile area. And so the miners' huts and storerooms, the loading ramps and pavements built to aid the transportation of stone, were scattered across that same broad area, close to the center of the workings, beside a fine large stella bearing coffer's name and announcing that the area had been a royal hunting ground dash this. Presumably, a hunt for stone, the expeditions of the Ijtoi king set. Up small offering tables, a few small sculptures and thirty odd steely. Some of whose folk art images of gods and kings suggest that they had. Been engraved by the hands of miners working in imitation of the fine. Manner of core craftsmanship. And one of these steely tells us directly. That in the time of Aminibid too an expedition had been sent to that. Lonely spot expressly for the purpose of bringing Mentet stone. Unlike the workshops of the Memphite court, those of Ijtoi do not seem to have used the stone from the Gable L A S R quarries in any great quantity, profuse sculptures, bowls or vases of the period cut from its beautifully veined and speckled nice appear to have survived. Near to Coffer Stella, however, their expeditions had mined some of the finely colored gems that were widely used by the jewelers and seal cutters of the Ijtoi court, laboriously extracting glistening red carnelian from seams of chalcedony. The jewelers of Ijtoi had been fascinated by the qualities of the fine stones that their miners extracted from the desert, and they set them exquisitely in golden mounts, and necklaces, bracelets and diadems, and beadwork of a dozen different kinds, in forms and settings that displayed the luminous qualities of crystal and garnet, jasper, feldspar, turquoise, carnelian, chalcedony and, in a special favorite, a distinctive pale amethyst of purplish-blue that was only found in the eastern desert, some twenty miles south of Aswan in the wasteland of the Wadi El Hudi, where there was a sprawl of mines similar to those at the hard stone. Quarries of the Gable El Anser drawn in high courtly style and engraved upon an especially imported stone, a cell found at the amethyst mines of the Wadi El Hudi describes an expedition to those mines that had been led by the vizier Hor in the time of Sen Wizard I like the journeys to the port of Sayu, these mining expeditions were conducted under the direct auspices of the high officials of the royal court, another cell, that of an official whose name is only partially preserved, declares that the man who sent me to carry away the amethyst had been none other than the vizier Antifoker, the courtier who was similarly memorialized at the port of Sayu and had overseen a voyage to the land of Punt. In the last seventy years, a mass of graffiti and small individual steely have been found at the amethyst mines, all of them products of courtly expeditions that were sent to the Wadi El Hudi, rain by rain, at the
Sam Raida's other royal missions were being dispatched to the seas and deserts. Two large open mines appeared to have been the focus of their activity in the Wadi El Hudi, the pale violet amethysts being separated from the matrix and the miners' encampments, where great heaps of colorless rock crystals still lie around their huts. The amethyst mines appear to have been worked out by later generations, but the quantities of gemstones that were removed in the time of the age Toei Kings must have been enormous, for still today, after millennia of plunder, the surviving jewelry of the period holds thousands of fine amethysts. Whilst its continued use and reuse throughout the Aegean and other regions of the eastern Mediterranean and centuries long after the mines, were no longer in operation shows that there had been a widespread traffic in that distinctive stone. The surviving inscriptions in the Wadi El Hadi tell that the mines were already open in the reign of the last Montuotep, at which time a small settlement of simple huts had been built on a hilltop close to one of the large open cast workings. In later reigns, a square state plan stone. Enclosure housing many more storerooms and shelters was erected a mile away from it beside the second large open mine. And somewhere in that general area, a small shrine was set up with two little obelisks, and several offering tables dedicated to the goddess Hathor, a divinity, commonly associated with bad lands and desert mines, in the same manner that Mary, mother of Jesus, is variously described in her. Different shrines around the world so, too, at every site in which a shrine. For Hathor, the mother of Horus, was established she is distinguished by a different local epithet. So the inscription on the stele of a certain Sararu, who describes himself as a keeper of the treasure chamber, tells that he had brought aromatic oils and resins like those obtained at Punt, to the little temple of Hathor, mistress of Amethyst, where he had performed the rituals for that goddess. At the same time he tells us that he brought water to every Thirsty man working in the Wadi El Hadi, perhaps by opening some of the many ancient wells in the vicinity, set on an irregular piece of local stone, Sararu's inscription is poorly made in the location where it was originally set up is lost, for like so. Many of the Wadi El Hadi inscriptions they were found and moved by desert travelers. It would appear, however, that Sararu Stella had once stood inside Hathor's lost temple for it holds an image of a statue of Sararu, standing, presumably, in the presence of the goddess. In the times of the Ijtoi kings many individuals set statues of themselves within the sanctuaries of shrines and temples. In such a desolate location, however, Sararu could hardly have found the craftsman or the stone to make a solid image of himself to stand in Hathor's presence, and so a line drawing of a statue had to do. The Wadi Hammamat is part of a network of valleys in Egypt's eastern desert that connects the modern town of Kieft, ancient Coptis, in the valley of the Nile to the Red Sea port of Xir. And since prehistoric times, miners, quarrymen, caravans of boat transporters, scribes, surveyors, Egyptians, Greeks, and Persians, Roman legionaries, Arameans, Christian monks and pagan South Arabians have left there. Various graffiti on its rocks and cliffs. Amongst these myriad inscriptions is a cartouche of Montu Otep II, accompanied by the same epithet with which he is described at the Gable Uinat in the Sahara, son of Re, not far away, along. Inscription describes the progress of an expedition led by Henanu, whose Splendid courtyard tomb lies to the north of Montuo II's dear El Bahari temple and who had also served at the court of that king's shadowy successor. Henanu's text within the Wadi Hammamat, indeed, describes an otherwise unrecorded expedition to punt from the court of Montuo III, of which no trace has been found at the port of Sayu, and which comprises the best part of the historical records of that obscure reign while serving as a prime pharaonic route to the Red Sea and to numerous gold mines in the surrounding hills, parts of the steep rock. Walls of Wadi Hammamet were also major quarries. The valley's cut reveals part of the remarkably varied strata of Egypt's geologic underbelly.
from granites, gray like and siltstone to rare high shining. Conglomerates of beautifully flecked greens, reds, grays and blacks along. With a colorful range of jaspers, cornelians and floor spars in the nearby. Hills. Siltstone, especially, the equitable rock that the fair onyx scribes. Called Beckon, was mined in considerable quantities within the wadi. Hammamat. For though bands of siltstone frequently occur throughout. The intractable mountains of the eastern desert, large sections of the. Wadi Hammamat's high dark cliffs are composed of that distinctive. Stone and the smooth floored wadi provides relatively easy access to the valley of the Nile, and from the first pharaoh to the last, Hammamats. Siltstone was continuously used within the royal workshops, as the track along the bottom of the wadi Hammamat twists up, through the Red Sea mountains through cliffs of green-gray siltstone and red gold-bearing granites, sometimes passing through narrow shadow. Quarters sometimes opening into wider sunlight areas, the stone walls of ancient huts and the traces of the ancient quarrymen lie all around. Half-finished sarcophagi and the roughed-out forms of abandoned statues that had shivered and cracked as they were being worked still lie at odd angles amongst heaps of shattered stone at the bottom of the quarry faces, and many of the cliffs and rocks within that moon-like landscape still hold the names of kings and quarrymen pecked lightly with a chip of that same rock onto the smooth gray cliffs and rocks, a process that embeds a whitish crystalline dust within their surfaces and serves to emphasize the lines of the inscriptions in the images. The texts are many and diverse. Some simply record the names of otherwise anonymous individuals, others, like that of the steward. Henanu, record the exploits of some of those millennial expeditions. Here, too. Great wide rock surfaces have allowed the ancient scribes space for an unusual loquacity, so they sometimes list the full titularies of the pharaohs whose courts dispatched those expeditions, their various participants in some of the incidents that had occurred along the way. And a great deal of this information is laid out in lines of state by hieroglyphs, in the measured manner of the finest stele of the court. Perhaps the most extraordinary of these records is inscribed in four. Long texts that describe a mining expedition undertaken during the reign of the last Montu Otep and led by a vizier named Aminuit, a man who many historians have suggested may have succeeded that king to the throne to become Aminuit I, in whose reign the royal residence was moved from Thebes to Ishtoi. As is usual with such memorials, the size of the workforce, which is quoted in round numbers and whose participants are described in a large List of professions and court titles appears enormous, assuming the ancient lists were composed in the manner of a modern balance sheet. The numbers of participants in a similar later expedition would have totaled almost 19,000 people. Such figures, however, may refer to man. Days of working rather than the numbers of the expedition's personnel. For that was a typical accounting method of the age, which enabled the Court to estimate the quantities of rations required for a specific task. Nonetheless, those nice round figures have been taken by generations of scholars as accurate, and thus those desert trips have been transformed into events resembling the field of the cloth of gold, with exaggerated visions of the administrative systems required to manage such vast events. Yet even the largest of stone blocks could not have commanded the attentions of such enormous crowds. Jamming the narrow wadi in their thousands, they would have thwarted the work of mining, emptied the scanty desert wells of water and consumed hundreds of tons of provisions during the months the miners are recorded as working in the desert. Nor, indeed, were such numbers required to pull the quarry blocks back to the valley of the Nile. So, whether or not they are a record of man days of working or simply an ancient equivalent of squillions, such figures should be taken in similar vein to the temple inscriptions which describe the construction of columns so high that they pierce the sky itself, or the text of another quarrying expedition to the Wadi Hammamat that claims to have filled the deserts with lakes and colonies of settlers. Hard archaeological evidence from a variety of pharaonic quarries shows that, in common with pyramid building, both quarrying in the
transportation of stone blocks had been a piecemeal affair and more inventive and less standardized in its methods than those exaggerated. Figures of personnel and lengthy lists of accompanying officials might suggest recent analysis of the largest of all the anciently recorded stony quarrying expeditions, for example, has concluded that, for its efficient operation, some 200 to 300 participants would have been required to extract and transport the stone described, and that, working in teams of 20, such a force covering 6 to 8 miles a day could have hauled. The quarry blocks back down the Wadi Hammamat to the valley of the Nile in just 10 days. In all likelihood, therefore, such expeditions were organized erratically. Whenever the court required more stone for its projects, and they were staffed by considerably less than a thousand people. In that respect, the mining expeditions had resembled the voyages to Punt, Henanu and several other court officials, indeed, are described as controlling both quarrying and voyaging expeditions. Everything about those quarry texts is enlarged and amplified, the task. The scribes described as traveling into the desert, to that zone between life and death, to obtaining the stone of royal statues and sarcophagi so that Pharaoh would live forever was, of itself, exaggerated. As the stoneworkers hacked out hard rock and quarries filled with the scent of sacrifice and incense, they had labored in a zone of marvels, one filled with the powers of gods and kings. Most of the Ij Toei kings are named within the Wadi Hammamat, and all of them appear to have sent expeditions to its quarries. Only a few of those texts, however, give more than a bare record of their expeditions. Only those inscriptions made in the first generations of the reunited kingdom record the spectacular dimensions of those journeys to a place. Apart, the timid approach of a gazelle, the roar of a flash flood, the presence of a god, to that zone where the physical and metaphysical of the pharaonic universe merged into a single landscape. Alabaster, beside the Nile. Not all the expeditions that the Ijtoi court dispatched entailed sea. Voyages or desert caravans. Like most of the stone blocks that were used. For building pyramids and temples, the pharaohs find white alabasters dash. Or travertine as geologists generically define them, were customarily quarry from cliffs close to the valley of the lower Nile. In Pharaoh's hard stone quarries, blocks were often disengaged with the aid of a carefully directed fire and by working the fire damaged portions of the rock with stones and wedges so that what the flame had rot was pounded from it, as an inscription in the Wadi Hamamat graphically describes. Alabaster, on the other hand, can be prized and split away from its matrix or simply cut with copper saws and chisels. Relatively soft when first extracted from the living rock, Egyptian. Alabaster hardens after a while and bleaches to brilliant whiteness on. Exposure to the sun. In pharaonic times, it held strong connotations of purity and was widely used for courtly bowls and vases, for amulets, for altars and embalming tables, as well as for statuary and shrines. So the famous statues of the king within Khafre's valley temple had stood on gleaming blocks of light-veined alabaster, and the enormous blood-collecting basins in the slaughtering courts of the Memphid sun temples were cut from the same stone. The largest of Egypt's nine known ancient alabaster quarries lies in the hills of Middle Egypt, some ten miles from the Nile and twelve miles upstream from the modern town of Malawi. The ancient name of these Quarries, Hadnab, literally House of Gold, was also that of an otherworldly region inhabited by the dead, and the same term was used, too, as a description of similarly ambiguous though entirely earthly locations such as burial crypts and temple shrines, like that which housed the image of a moon re within Sen Wazirat I's temple at Karnak. Hadnab's ancient quarries consist of a series of irregular open cuts and Tunnels and a few wide appended veins of alabaster that are exposed on the ridges of the low sloping limestone hills, some ten miles from the river, on its eastern bank. Though Hadnob alabaster was certainly used by earlier pharaonic craftsmen, the first recorded visit of the court to that most generous deposit was in the time of Khufu, when that monarch's name and image, a very rare occurrence for his time, 
was sculpted high. Above an ancient quarry track upon a worked quarry face. Subsequently, the names of several other Memphis monarchs and many of their courtiers were also drawn within the quarries. Following the old kingdom's dissolution, local governors had mined Hadnab's alabaster on their own account, as their ancient inscriptions in the quarries tell. Then, following the restoration of the court, Montuo Tebtu's name appears and, quite untypically though in common, with the inscriptions of a Saharan expedition, the royal epithet the sun. Of Ri was set inside rather than outside his cartouche. After that royal reappearance, the names of several later kings and many of their courtiers appear within these quarries, in inked hieratic text upon him. Alabaster Ostrakhan from the quarries records the numbers of a seemingly enormous expedition that had taken place in the reign of Senwajrit Bri. Taken altogether, that rich gathering of inscriptions shows that the Oldest fair on a quarry at Hatna was a considerable sheer-sided egg-shaped cut, some fifty feet in depth and almost two hundred feet across, in which Khufu's name and image had been inscribed. Fresh workings, however, subterranean and open cast, appear to have been initiated in the times of the Montuoteps. Set a mile to the west of the older quarries, a broad new track was laid down through the hills to join a larger older causeway that ran across a wide flat plain to landings at the riverside, and the waiting stone barges, and the times of the Ijtoi kings, Hatnub's quarries had been, controlled by a succession of regional governors whose tombs, a line of chapels with beautifully refined internal architecture, were set in high limestone cliffs near to the modern village of Deir el Bersha, opposite Malawi. The governor's tombs stand over the considerable burying grounds of the communities that they had once controlled, the area, indeed, appears to have been heavily inhabited in ancient times and holds extensive remains of ancient alabaster workshops in an as yet unexcavated town site. It may well be that the alabaster ostrakhan which describes a huge quarrying enterprise during the reign of Senwajrit III records the same ambitious project that is pictured in a unique scene in the tomb chapel of one of those governors, a man named Jehushotep. Four gangs of men are shown hauling a statue of a seated man lashed to a wooden sledge, which an accompanying inscription describes as the transport of a statue of thirteen cubits of Hatnub stone, that is, of a statue that had stood some twenty-two feet high and had weighed around eighty tons. This long tomb chapel inscription begins by recounting the hauling of a single enormous stone block out of the quarry, a block that is described as squared, that is, a block that has been roughly shaped into the traditional form of a pharaonic seated statue, a labor that would have required the careful attentions of master craftsmen to ensure that the pose and proportions of the finished statue were well contained within the stone. Then, gangs of men recruited from the surrounding farmsteads had hauled that great block along the quarry's purpose-built slipways to loading keys at the riverside. Jehusha Tep's texts describe how the work of dragging the large block was difficult for the haulers because the ground was very hard, and that the ancient slipway along which the unfinished statue was hauled had passed up and down on its way through the foothills. In fact, the designers of the ancient quarry tracks had greatly aided the progress of large blocks by driving a straight track through the stony hills that traverse the lowest natural angles in the landscape and by further leveling the terrain in a series of considerable cuttings and embankments in the manner of railway engineers. It has been estimated that the groups of ancient huts alongside one of these ancient tracks were of sufficient size to have accommodated 300 people, about the same number that is recorded in the contemporary Inventories of desert caravans. As with the ancient activities of caravanning, of building pyramids and of sculpting colossal statues, a strong cohesion, a sense of fraternity even, was essential between the members of such groups, with each man pulling an estimated dead weight of some two hundred pounds, encouraging such great stone blocks to anciently through the hills down to the riverside and onto barges was a perilous activity, a slow progress marked out along the trackways by a
series of small cairns and accompanied by prayers and drum beats, and probably also by rhythmic group singing, just as similar activities are often undertaken in non-industrial societies today. A section of the lengthy text from Lenny's tomb at Abidus describes the progress of an earlier expedition to Hatnam, in which he had obtained alabaster for a large offering table. It had taken seventeen days, De Stella tells, to quarry the stone and slide it to the riverside harbor, where men Working under one e's supervision had built a 100-foot stone barge, especially to transport the alabaster blocks to the workshops of the royal residence. I moored at the royal pyramid in safety, when he's report concludes, it happened through my offices and entirely in accordance with the order of the king. The skilled and time-consuming processes of sculpting and finishing a colossus such as that of Jehu Shotep would certainly have been Undertaken in the governor's workshops, close to the craftsmen's homes, and close, presumably, to its eventual emplacement sitting within a local temple. So to modernize the unique scene in Jehushotep's tomb, chapel would appear to picture the last stages of the statue's journey as it is pulled up from the river landing to its final destination by four teams of rope haulers, each one of which comprises twenty-one pairs of men. Mounted on a sturdy wooden sledge, the finished and painted colossus has been carefully padded with ox skins to protect it from chafing on the massive hauling ropes that have been tightened around the statue with the aid of twisting sticks. A chanting priest stands on the statue's knees, clapping out the rhythms of the haulage gangs in a cry that is recorded in hieroglyphs above his head, Jehushotep, beloved of the king, a Figure at the statue's feet pours water to lubricate the passage of its mighty sledge. A team of water carriers and another carrying sturdy. Rolling logs further aid the statue's progress, whilst the projects overseers, the master sculptor Neki Ankin Seppa, his son, walk alongside in attendance, and all the while priests burn clouds of incense to aid the statue's progress from the otherworldly edges of the dry high desert and to the living kingdom. The numbers of men required for these colossal labors are clearly shown, and, as in the Wadi Hammamat, they flatly contradict the figures listed in the ancient texts, rather than serving as a modern accounting of a workforce's size, those texts were intended to emphasize, like the splendid scene in Jehushotep's tomb chapel, the magnitude of the task performed in the strength and enthusiasm of its participants. As for Jehushotep himself, none of the ancestors, he states, nor the local officials, nor the administrators of the settlement had thought of doing what I have done. I have established a chapel and offering altars, and this statue for all eternity. Ironically, there is no trace today of Jehushotep's alabaster colossus, and only the words and images within his tomb chapel remain. 25. The Levant and Nubia. Travelers to an antique land. Dug over and about for centuries, the ruins of ancient Memphis lie at the edge of the cultivation in plain sight of the Saqqara pyramids. This had been the city of palaces and temples that the ancient Greek and Roman travelers celebrated as the archaic ancient capital of Pharaoh. Today, it is a scattered sprawl of dusty mud brick mounds amidst old village houses, clumps of palms, blocks of stone and a pretty, rush fringed pool, which fills the sites of several early digs. No evidence survives of a Memphis of the times of the Ijtoi kings, nor, indeed, of the times when Menes, the legendary first pharaoh, was supposed to have built a mighty dam and fortress at the capital of his newly conquered kingdom. At a place named Memphis, Archaeologists had been reluctant to excavate those silty ruined fields. Until 1905, when Flunder's Petrie came to search for the plan of the Temple of the Memphis Deity Ptah, one of several sanctuaries of Memphis that the classical writers had described as being as large as Karnak and far older. What Petrie found, however, were the ruins of a temple erected in the time of Ramses II, the stones of which had been called from dozens of earlier tomb chapels and temples. And there it was, 
amidst the dust of ancient mud brick and a jigsaw of broken stone, that he uncovered an irregular slab of granite bearing a lengthy, hieroglyphic text describing some of the offerings and donations that King Amenhotep II had made to temples, to courtiers and to royal mortuary cults. In the 1990s, further work inside the ruins of Ramses' temple brought to light a larger fragment of that same granite slab, which had been recycled to serve as part of the base of a colossal statue that had stood beside the temple's doorway. The original location of the complete inscription is unknown. Had it stood in a lost and unknown temple of the Ijchoi kings or had it been taken from one of the temples of Amenhotep II's pyramid, which had stood a few miles to the south? The historical importance of those fragments lies in the fact that the fifty columns of hieroglyphs that they hold between them is one of the largest formal documents to have survived from the period of the Ishtoi kings. So, though the fragments do not share a common edge in their surfaces, are partly lost, the damaged text yet holds information about aspects of the history of the Ijtoi kings that are mostly shrouded in uncertainty. Whilst the lengthy reign of Amenhotep II, his household, his monuments, and any narrative of the history of his reign, is virtually unknown. As one authority has observed, although the king ruled more than thirty years, few monuments are datable to his time. His family relations are unclear. It can be assumed that he was the son of Senwajrat I, but this is not precisely stated anywhere. The text on those two broken granite slabs holds part of a record of a two-year period in Amenhotep II's reign, similar in style to the earlier royal annals, though providing greater detail, it appears to have been part of a larger history of the time, a history that the royal court had considered to be of sufficient import to record in well-cut hieroglyphs. Upon enormous slabs of granite, Petrie's fragment holds part of a list of traditional funerary endowments that were common to both courtiers and kings, lands are granted to supply the produce for the cult, quantities of bread, beer, grain, cakes, and wild fowl are specified to be delivered to the altars and the priestly communities serving the mortuary cult in the temples of his predecessor, King Senwajrat I, and other lists of offerings are granted to state temples, to Amun at Thebes, and to a temple of the god Ptah, the ancient Memphi deity, whose dwelling was given granite steely and columns of cedar wood inlaid with gems and precious metals. The text upon the larger second stone, alternatively, contains what Western historians have traditionally considered to be real history, for amidst more lists of donations and endowments to temples at Karnak, taught in Memphis, Armand and Heliopolis, accounts of the distribution of rewards to certain courtiers in the reception of Nubians in desert. Dwellers at the Ijtoi court, it describes the progress of a royal expedition from the Nile Delta to some Bronze Age settlements in the northern Levant. Unfortunately, the history of that journey is difficult to follow. The locations named in the text remain unidentified, in many of the words. Describing the expedition's personnel are still little understood. Yet the outline of the journey seems clear enough, for it is depicted in terms similar to those used on the stele that describe voyages from the Red Sea ports and mining expeditions into the eastern desert. Here, however, the text does not tell of expeditions to mysterious places in Africa or to the High Sahara, but of a journey along the most ancient land and sea. Routes of the Eastern Mediterranean to other ancient courts. Fair onic voyages on the Eastern Mediterranean departed from ports within the Niles Delta and crossed the coast of northern Sinai before heading northwards, up along the Levantine seaboard toward Syria and Cilicia, a route that ran parallel to an accompanying ancient land route. The caravan track known as the Way of Horus. The sea voyage the Stella's damaged text described seems to have visited ports and settlements on the Lebanese coast and even, perhaps, the Isle of Cyprus, which would have added only an extra day to a four- or five-day trip, most of which would have consisted of a series of short hops along the Mediterranean coastline. Having arrived in the North Levant, the broken text appears to tell 
the crew and militia on Pharaoh's boats had joined. With an overland expedition that had previously traveled up along the Way of Horus, and together they hacked down the walls of two settlements. Both the boats and the overland expedition then appeared to have returned to Ichtoi with prisoners and goods, some of which were carried in caravan across Sinai and some shipped back in two boats. All and all, the adventure had taken seven months, along with many traditionally minded Egyptologists today. Champollion and Maspero would certainly have considered this a record of a ruthless raid, a military campaign in which regiments of infantry and marines had been sent off to plunder foreign cities. Here is a conventional view, as expressed by Donald Redford. The problem with such interpretations is that, although the lengthy lists of goods and peoples that are described as being brought from the Havana are remarkably specific, the terms of their acquisition are extremely vague. The story of the expedition is mixed with lines of text that appear to be quite unrelated, and even those parts of the inscription that describe the relationship between its two components, land and sea, are far from clear, and the expedition's disparate personnel have been variously translated as groups, work gangs or armies, as civilian or military, according to the translator's disposition. Was this, then, an expedition like those of the southern caravans that had been sent from the Ishtoi court to acquire materials and goods from the Levant as gifts or tribute and had engaged in some kind of small-scale conflict? Or was it a naval and military operation dispatched by the court to plunder goods and people by brute force? One thing seems sure, a reasonable estimate of the expedition's size, based both on the journey's long duration and the logistics of other Ichtoi expeditions suggests that this Levantine excursion was undertaken by just a few hundred people, for the territories through which it passed had been sparsely inhabited by tribes of semi-pastoralists and could hardly have sustained larger numbers for any length of time. Clearly, acts of cruelty, sacking and rapine need not be excluded from such adventures and certainly some form of militia may well have been included to protect the expedition's personnel, provisions and goods. Yet, there is no shred of evidence that there were standing armies in middle kingdom times, nor is there evidence that the modern distinctions of military, commercial and diplomatic enterprises can be sensibly applied to that most ancient world. So just as there is no evidence of foreign armies threatening the Ijtoi kingdom, there is little possibility that it undertook an extensive military campaign of plundering in the Levant. The traditional visions of pharaonic regiments returning to Ichtoian triumph after plundering the east are little more than an orientalist. Fantasia. At all events, whatever the means by which that expedition had acquired, by barter or by plunder, as tribute, gifting or exchange, the Long lists of foreign products that are so carefully enumerated on the Granite text is another fine example of the Ij Toi court's determination to obtain the materials required for the full maintenance of courtly life copper and cedarwood, silver, precious stones, lead, malachite, varieties of plants for the temple gardens, abrasive sands for the pharaonic stone, workshops and aromatic oils and resins for cosmetics in the embalmer studios. Cheryl Ward's reconstructed Biblis boat suggests that each of the two vessels of the Levantine expedition could have returned home to port, carrying cargoes of some 15 tons. The granite text, in fact, tells that their manifest had included more than half a ton of metals, mostly silver, copper and bronze, hundreds of ceramic storage jars of various sizes containing aromatic oils and resins, 200 sacks of spices and timber with which to build ten more similar-sized boats, or, alternatively, a sufficient quantity of darkly aromatic cedar planks, famed for their preservative qualities, to build about a hundred of the massive coffins in which the royal family and their courtiers were laid to rest. All in all, this is a cargo that two Biblis boats could well have accommodated, in a society without money, in which nothing was counted as explicitly economic or political, the prime purpose of the acquisition of
such goods was not to gain prestige or possessions in the modern manner, like the stones mine in the desert and the wonderful things. From Hunt, those goods from the Levant were part of the essential ingredients of the state, a fact wonderfully borne out by the discovery in the 1930s of a treasure packed into four sturdy solid copper chests, each bearing the car touches of a minuitu, which French archaeologists found buried underneath the pavement in the beautiful temple of Todd, a few miles upstream from Thebes, cushioned in clean yellow sand, the four chests, each one around a foot and a half long and half as wide, were filled with precious objects, beautifully worked seals made in the workshops of Anatolia and Iran, raw gems, lapis lazuli, amethyst, quartzes and obsidians, ten gold ingots, and gold jewelry, 150 silver bowls of rare design and some silver. Ingots along with large amounts of silver and electron scrap, the debris of jewelry workshops. The four copper chests alone weighed 280 pounds, and they had held some 15 pounds of gold and perhaps twice that amount of silver before corrosion took its toll. Recent analyzes have determined that the silver of the bowls, which are of unique design and unknown manufacture, was mined in either Anatolia or the Greek islands, the copper and the Levant or regions further north. Many of Todd's treasures, indeed, are similar to contemporary objects that have been found in ancient settlements throughout the eastern Mediterranean whose workshops had held a commonality of culture. Here, though, they were not found in fragments nor as a solitary treasure as is usually the case in archaeology, but in the fullness of an ancient hoard. Remarkably, many of the objects found in the copper chests are similar in their materials and forms to those listed and described in the granted texts of the time of Aminivit II as the products of the courts. Expedition to the North Levant and the Temple of Montu at Tadiz, specifically listed in that text as the recipient of a royal donation whilst the four caskets bear Aminivit II's name. If those expeditions had been a military adventure then this treasure would best be described as booty hidden away, perhaps in time of peril. If, alternatively, those goods had been obtained by other means, then the poor chests and their contents would best be described as a royal endowment, but one that was not displayed as booty or church plate nor placed within a treasure chamber but carefully buried underneath the temple's pavement, as in the darkness of a tomb. Those chests, therefore, are best seen as holding goods brought from regions far outside the orbit of the state and bear it see like in the house of a court god, between the seen and unseen world, an act that had beautifully expressed a concept, which is explicitly stated in later texts, that the domain of Pharaoh encompasses all earthly things. A second similarly scanty but yet more informative record of another Pharaonic excursion to the Levant by land and sea had been led by the Vizier Khamhotep, who had also supervised a voyage to the land of Punt from the port of Sayu. Undertaken a few decades later, this expedition had consisted of a sea voyage along the coast of the Levant to some of the ports of Lebanon dash this being the first known occurrence of that word. This text had been engraved on the elaborate limestone facades of Khamhotep's splendid mastaba that had stood beside the pyramid of Sen was at three at Dashur. The tomb, however, was demolished by ancient lime burners and the surviving fragments of its texts, which number in their hundreds and were scattered all around the tomb, were only recently reassembled to reveal what James Allen, their meticulous editor and interpreter, has described as one of the more important historical texts of the Middle Kingdom. Though only 40% of the original survives, those fragments yet provide a vivid outline of Khamhotep's account of a voyage of a state. Flotilla to the seaport of al -Aza in northern Lebanon to obtain cedar. Wood. Before arriving at al -Aza, however, Khamhotep's boats had put in at the port of Biblis, whose rulers had long since supplied the fair onic court with cedar wood and whose ancient temples were Stocked with fine fair onic gifts made in the Memphis workshops. Here, so Khamhotep's broken textile, he had visited the palace of the local ruler, a man the text calls Maliki, which, and the local Semitic 
language, was simply a term for king. After the appropriate greetings had been observed and offerings made, Maliki asked why Kumhotep's boats were headed north to Olaza. This was, apparently, a rather pointed question, for the Ijtoi kings do not seem to have maintained the Memphite pharaoh's millennial connections with Biblis, which was currently in dispute with Olaza, Maliki having recently dispatched a hundred fighting men to that settlement under the command of his son. In the reply, the broken text reports, Kemotep had reminded Maliki of the earlier relationship between Pharaoh and the rulers of Biblis, whilst hinting all the while that a pharaonic land force was marching northwards up the way of Horus to the Lebanon. Whether this was intended as a threat or a proposal of alliance is unclear. At all events, the upshot of the encounter was that Pharaoh and Maliki of Biblis exchanged letters renewing their previous relationship of ruler and vassal, and, though the ending of the tale is lost, it seems unlikely that Kamotep would have had the text inscribed upon his tomb had he not returned with cedar wood. A contemporary text upon a funerary stella of a courtier named Kuzebek may part confirm Kamhotep's broken account, for it too. Tells how the Levant had acceded to the well of San Wajer III. It describes how Kuzebek, after having previously overthrown some Nubians in the south, had traveled in the Levant with a squad of men, dot nigh, struck the northern foreigner and had his weapons, as San Wajer lives. For me, the text continues, I have spoken the truth. And he, Sen Wajrit, 3, gave me a staff of electrum, an alloy of precious metals, for my hand, and a sheath and dagger worked in electrum. Though said no less literary style than the text from the tomb of the vizier Kanonhotep, this would appear to describe an intervention in which a militia had safeguarded pharaonic interests. Curiously enough, a rockfall that occurred in the 1920s which brought down part of the splendid sea coast overlooking Biblis Ancient. Harbor had already provided an inadvertent footnote to those two stories. For the collapse of the cliff exposed a cemetery of some of the rulers of Biblis, the oldest of which had governed just a few decades. After Kamhotep's encounter with Maliki, the city's king, although the two oldest burials in that seaside cemetery those of Abishemu and Ipishemu were no longer named as kings, as Maliki, the two rulers had been interred as would befit a courtier of Pharaoh, in two great pharaonic coffins with traditional pharaonic inlays set into their sides. And though those two great wooden boxes had rotted in the damp air of the coast, one might well guess that they had been made, in the manner of pharaonic burials, of cedar wood, besides local jars of Provisions in a superb Levantine copper sword, those two princes had been buried with fine made pharaonic objects from Ijtoi. Abi Shemu's sarcophagus held a beautifully finished vase cut from a rare block of velvet black obsidian, handsomely framed and lined with bands of yellow gold engraved with a Minivit III's cartouche, while Saipi Shemu's crypt held a fine small chest of obsidian and gold bearing one of the names of a Minivit III and a great stone vase engraved with the Name of that king's successor, Maminivit IV. Such donations, and other gold work from the Ijtoi jewelry workshops has also come to light at Biblis, suggests that the city's rulers were supplying cedar to the court of Pharaoh once again, and were receiving royal favors in exchange. Similar hordes of fine pharaonic goods, of gold and hat and of alabaster, and amethyst from Wadi el Hadi that point to other Levantine contacts. With the Ijtoi court have been found in the great graves of Ebla, in enormous walled city set in the hills to the north of Biblis some 70 miles from the Mediterranean coast. The nature of the traffic between Ebla and the Ijtoi court, however, is otherwise unknown, as are the reasons for similar but less spectacular finds of objects made in Middle Kingdom Egypt that have been excavated throughout the region. None of. This tells us if the rulers and the peoples of those cultures, Pharaonic and Levantine, had regarded one another in fear or friendship. The setting of a story, the near contemporary tale of the adventures of Sinuhe, the longest and most celebrated work of literature from ancient 
Egypt, which has survived in many and various forms, would, however, appear to hold something of that lost reality, just as aspects of Victorian. London make their appearance in the works of Dickens. Composed in the times of the first Ijtoe kings, the story of Sinue tells how he had fled the Nile Valley at the death of Pharaoh because, for reasons never clearly stated, he thought himself endangered, lacking water in his long journey north and thinking that he is dying, Sinuhe. Hears cattle lowing and is rescued by some herders whose leader recognizes the courtier from his visits to the Nile Valley, given water, and then milk to drink, Sinuhe heads for Biblis. Months go by, however, as he is passed powerlessly from court to court until one of the local rulers, a certain Amonesh, takes him to his home in the northern Levant, where several Sinue's countrymen were already in residence. You will be happy with me, Amonesh tells the fugitive, for you will hear the speech of your own country. Sinue then tells his Levantine host about Pharaoh's death, and in reply Amonesh launches into a lengthy Panegyric, Pharaoh is a peerless and far-striding god, he says, and none can escape his arrow. He is a lord of kindness and sweetness, a king who conquered in the egg, who was born to smite Levantines and sand. Dwellers. Amonesh then adopts Inuhe and places him amongst his family, giving him land rich with figs and grapes, honey and barley and cattle without number. And Sinue lived at the court of Amonesh. Serving him as he would have served a pharaoh, scribes copied the story of Sinuhe's adventures for a thousand years and more and used it as an exemplar for their peoples. Though the bulk of the text describes modes of rhetoric and the manners and comportment of pharaonic courtly life rather than a narrative of high adventure, modern interest has mostly been concerned with debates about its use of grammar and the amount of political history it may or may not contain. One truth the story indisputably holds is that the pharaonic scribe describes his Levantine neighbors in terms of kindness and humanity rather than as actors in the bloodthirsty two-dimensional politics that are so often conjured from the surviving texts. The Sinai Station, a Levantine synthesis though working far from the valley of the Lower Nile, the copper miners of Sinai had a pharaonic temple in their midst, a royal foundation established in the times of the Ijtoi kings that housed the goddess Hathor, Lady of Turquoise, her cult her festivals and offerings in the settlement of her attending priests, their families and assistants. Set high in the mountains and some thirty miles from the sea at a site known now as Serbet el Khadam, Hathor's house in Sinai stood like the Theban cliff-top temple of the Montuo Teps at the peak of a high hill. Clusters of its steely and the stone of its beams and lintels still stand along the skyline like rows of broken teeth. The beginnings of this temple lay in its modest central shrine, a small cave set into the crest of the cliff. Similarly unsophisticated cave shrines were found beside several desert tracks that were used by pharaonic travelers. But only the shrine at Sarabit el Khadam lies outside the valley of the Lower Nile, standing utterly alone within its landscape, entirely disconnected to the orientation of a river, star or human settlement, its unique shape simply determined by the angle of the sandstone ridge on which it stood. Yet in the same manner that desert cairns commonly marked out the way ahead on ancient caravan tracks, so Hathor's cliff-top temple stood on a route by which the millennial traffic traveled down to Egypt from the Levant, a route parallel to the way of horse that ran down through modern Syria and Jordan and which is known nowadays by the biblical term the King's Highway. Sarabit el Khadam was a charmed location. Millennia before a pharaoh's court had been founded, the craftsmen of the Lower Nile had already understood the subtle relationship between copper and turquoise, as they made turquoise-colored glazes using copper or as a colorant. Brought from unearthly regions at the boundaries of life and death, such materials had been transported into the regions of the Lower Nile to stand at the heart of the pharaonic state. The mountain at Sarabit el Khadam held in its living rock glistening veins of turquoise that the ancients had long quarried, whilst major pharaonic copper mines, including those of the Wadi Magara, lay in the valleys to the east and west. And as the extraction of such materials could only be accomplished by employing the resources of the pharaonic court, Turquoise held a regal aura and was widely used in courtly jewelry. Thus it was duly celebrated in the Shrine of Hathor, Lady of Turquoise, who was, in her turn, the mother of Horus and Nuss, a pharaoh and of the state itself. The temple at Sarabit el Khadam was successively enlarged throughout the times of the Ijtoi king so that it came to include a shrine for the royal ancestors and other gods. The workmen enclosed the approach to the little cave in a series of rectangular courtyards, 
gateways and offering halls and surrounded the whole with dry stone walls which, in the traditional manner, held the houses of the temple priests along with potteries, bakeries and even furnaces for copper smelting. Numerous texts describe how this remarkable establishment had been provisioned in much the same manner as the copper miners had been, with supplies sent directly from Ijtoi accompanied by some of the court sculptors, who cut fine drawn inscriptions into the local stone, and potters, who made courtly tableware on site from local clay. Large numbers of stele, all measured out and cut in high court style, were set up at Sarabit el Qadim in the times of the Ijtoi kings. Well over fifty have been recorded, and many more must have been lost or broken or simply eroded beyond all recognition or, indeed, now stand in faraway museums. Nonetheless, those ancient dedications had been so numerous that modern visitors on their way up to the central cave still passed through a small forest of such monoliths. Most of these stelae show the monarch of the day in the usual fashion, and the presence of the shrine's goddess. Others were inscribed on behalf of the courtiers who oversaw the provisions that were dispatched from Ijtoi to all of its various enterprises, including those in Sinai. And hundreds of graffiti were cut directly onto the surrounding rocks along the ancient pathways to the temple, naming and sometimes picturing the humbler members of those courtly expeditions, their guides and scribes, foremen, the cattle herders, scorpion catchers and quarrymen. Some cut small stone offering altars and little steely, many of which were made by unskilled hands and dedicated to some of Hathor's companions in that splendid wilderness, the gods of Heliopolis, the Nile Delta and the Eastern Desert. Just as the rows of standing stele at Sarabit el Qadim had resembled the obelisks at the Biblis temple and those at other sites in the Levant, so the internal architecture of the temple also bears comparison with Levantine shrines. Sarabit el Qadim, in fact, is a geographic and cultural halfway house between those relatively modest structures and contemporary pharaonic temples. To that extent, and like the story of Sinue, it demonstrates a communality shared by the Ijtoi court and their northern neighbors. And that was new for their Memphite predecessors had cut reliefs upon the rocks of Sinai that show Pharaoh smiting his northern neighbors with the mace. Just as Nubians had served in the southern expeditions of the Ijtoi pharaohs, so in those same times some of Pharaoh's northern neighbors had worked in the Sinai copper mines. Some of their leaders, too, had paid visits to the site where they were celebrated in Pharaonic relief. One man is shown riding a long-eared Syrian donkey and carrying the same distinctive weapons that are pictured in the painting of the young Khnomhotep in his father's tomb chapel at Beni Hassan, which shows him greeting the members of a Levantine caravan. Recent archaeology in the Wadi Arba has shown that Levantines had been mining and smelting copper in the deserts to the north and east of Sinai for millennia, and the copper workers of the Ijtoi pharaohs may well have employed their expertise. The ancestors of the Levantines shown at Sarabit el Qadim, indeed, might also have mined the ores of Sinai long before craftsmen of the Memphite pharaohs had cut those apprehensive images of their northern neighbors upon its dark red rocks. The most remarkable product of these cultural encounters in the high desert was discovered in the course of a pioneering expedition into Sinai in the winter of 1904-5 during which Petrie had located and copied a small number of short, stick-like inscriptions that, although they had first appeared to be but badly formed hieroglyphs, had subsequently proved indecipherable. One of these strange texts had been inscribed on the base of a small locally made statue of a sphinx, others were scratched directly onto crude pharaonic statues. Most, however, had been scored onto rocks around the mouths of mine shafts. Ten years after their discovery and in a work that he would later describe as his single most important contribution to ancient history, the great Egyptologist Alan Gardner published an essay on those same inscriptions entitled The Egyptian Origins of the Semitic Alphabet. Though part related to pharaonic hieroglyphs, Gardner asserted, these graffiti had been written in a previously unknown alphabet a few signs, of which, he demonstrated, spelled out the name of the goddess, Balad, the goddess of Biblis' largest temple whom the pharaonic inscriptions at that site had identified with Hathor. Considering their age, Gardner concluded, those brief inscriptions were far and away the earliest known. Form of Semitic writing, for Balat's name signifies queen or lady in. That widespread group of ancient languages, a group which contains many modern languages as well. Millennia later, indeed, and on another continent, those same spare letters would also form the backbone of the Greek and Latin alphabets. Considerable amounts of research have since been conducted on these.
so-called proto-Sinaitic texts, though less than 150 of. Those spare inscriptions have ever been located. A handful have been found in the South Levant, scratched into rocks beside copper mines. Close to the King's Highway and a few more have been spotted to the west of Thebes on a rocky outcrop alongside an ancient caravan route. The great majority, however, are at Sarabit el Qadim and Arisen. Analysis suggests that the forms of their letters were derived from hieroglyphs that were visible at that site in the times of the Ijtoi kings. So the lengthy processes by which some of the elements of fair onic hieroglyphs were transformed into the letters used in this book appear to have had their beginnings far from the centers of ancient culture, in a remarkable ancient synthesis of cultures that took place on a Sinai hilltop, Levantine settlements, Amorites and Tel El Daba. In the times of the Ijtoi kings the Levant was largely populated by a people of a widespread and disparate culture who would have a remarkable and long-lasting impact on the history of ancient Egypt. This culture has been traditionally described as Amorite, a term that should not be confused with that same word in the Old Testament, where it is employed to distinguish one of the tribes of Canaan and its historical sense. The term Amorite was coined by a group of late 18th century German linguists to describe one of the earliest forms of a major modern language group, which had previously been termed Oriental, but which, in another of their biblical borrowings, those same linguists had renamed as Semitic, after Shem, the son of Noah. The first known traces of the Amorite language are in Mesopotamian. Texts of the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC. No texts appear to have been written in Amorite, however, the scribes of Mesopotamia and the Levant always employing the traditional literary languages of Mesopotamia. So the appearance of Amorite in those regions is only witnessed by the growing use of Semitic words in the novel names of people and of deities in texts written in other languages. That rare phenomenon, however, finds powerful archaeological concordance in the simultaneous appearance of a distinctive material culture with a highly specific range of bronze weaponry and walled enclosures. Thus, identified, Amorite culture, a synthesis of written and material artifacts, can be seen to have spread throughout the region during the following millennium, a diffusion that led to unsubstantiated theories of an Amorite invasion of the ancient East from Central Asia, and much the same manner that the Victorians had described the barbarian invasions at the ending of the Roman Empire. In the times of the Ijtoi pharaohs, people of Amorite culture had long since taken control of the ancient Mesopotamian city-state, whilst previously modest settlements, such as Babylon and Mari on the Euphrates, had been greatly enlarged in girdened fortress walls. In the Levant, where Amorite culture appears to have arisen, some of the larger settlements were similarly building mud brick fortifications as protection from their fractious neighbors and texts of the period tell of the formation of confederations of levantine settlements based at various times at cities such as biblis and ashkelon and archaeological sites such as ebla ugarit and katna like homer in a later age the court scribes of the times sing of their rulers martial exploits in a vivid formal prose of cruelty and conflict, so that their texts give the impression that the cities and confederations of both Mesopotamia and the Levant were engaged in continuous bouts of warfare and that their roles in the history of the region had continuously changed. Yet archaeology has shown that those fortified confederations were also engaging in elaborate processes of gifting and bartering and that the high-walled cities were providing security for caravans and enabling the ancient transport networks to operate more fluidly than before, a traffic that, through the levying of ties on transported goods, was enriching the material culture of the rulers. The very presence of those fortresses, indeed, appears to have signaled a kind of stability in the region rather than an age of interminable small-scale warfare. At all events, these new Levantine trading networks served to connect a spectrum of ancient cultures and traditions from Persia and Afghanistan to the flood plains of Mesopotamia and the coastal cities of the Levant. 
Here, then, was their point of contact with the court of Ijtoi, which, as we have seen, took in enormous quantities of Levantine. Timber, copper, wine and fruit, olive oil and unguents, along with lapis. Lazuli and ingots of copper, tin and silver from far more distant regions. In return, some of the finest products of the Ijtoi workshops were sent up along those age-old highways, to the courts of Biblis, Hazor and Katna, Mari, Ugri, and Ebla. So, despite the scribes' bloodthirsty prose, the extent of internecine warfare in the Levant of those times need not be exaggerated. Hostilities, indeed, may well have taken the form of ritual combat between lavishly equipped Bronze Age champions. Certainly, there is no evidence of pitch battles having taken place, and archaeologists have found scant. Evidence of siege within the hundreds of ancient fortresses in Mesopotamia and the Levant. Outside the cemeteries, only a handful of corpses have ever been recovered from the excavation of the fortresses, and those are more suggestive of a fracas than a mass assault, and the soft ash and burnt brick of fire and destruction has seldom been encountered. At all events, the rise of Amorite culture had not interrupted the underlying rhythms of Middle Eastern Bronze Age. Society, indeed, it had facilitated the dispersal of technologies and design, a remarkably creative process that was accompanied by an increasing material prosperity. Levantine workshops, especially, were expert in the ancient arts of casting copper and in mixing it with small quantities of tin, arsenic and lead to aid its flow in casting ore to produce a bronze or other alloy that was harder than pure smelted copper. Nothing so exemplifies the reality of this new culture as its so-called warrior graves, which are found throughout the Levant and Mesopotamia and also in the Nile Delta Dash. Burials of men interred with a range of fine-made weapons, including axes, daggers and spear points, wrought with copper mined in the Levant, and Anatolia, in Cyprus and on the Greek mainland. These were cold hammered into their final forms, a technique that involved the constant annealing of the copper alloy blades, which gave those elegant novel arms remarkably hard edges. The most distinctive element of this sophisticated arsenal is the so-called duck bill axe blade, which with its curving wooden handle is pictured in an enormous range of contemporary images. In the tomb, Chapel of Kamhotep's father at Beni Hassan, for example, two such weapons, neatly balanced in their carrier's right hands, appear in the sharply observed painting of a Levantine caravan. Here, alongside their harps and weaving spools, their bows and throw sticks, their tamed ibex, and their packed donkeys, the distinctively dressed in coiffured group is identified as 37 Amu from Shu. Following the Old Testament use of the term, early Egyptologists had identified these exotics as the Amorites of Shu. Today, however, they are usually described as Asiatics, a word which, whilst it avoids biblical allusion and thus inadvertent reference to political tensions in the modern Levant, is as nebulous as the term Libyans, often employed to describe all the ancient peoples who inhabited the regions to the west of the ancient Nile. Valley. Fair onyx craftsmen of later ages came to distinguish the various subcultures of their northern neighbors by their tattoos, clothing and hairstyling, distinguishing them as precisely as they differentiated species of birds and animals. Yet there is still debate about the origins of the Amorites slash Asiatics of Shu in the Beni Hassan tomb chapel, for whilst their dress, their weaponry and comportment clearly show that the fair onyx draftsmen had identified their material culture as Levantine, they did not distinguish them precisely. Was Shu a region or a place? Were the Amu people from the north or south Levant, from Palestine, the Lebanon or Syria? Were they nomadic shepherds, the sand dwellers that many fair onyx texts describe, or were they envoys from one of the high-walled settlements in the North Levant? The question has great resonance in the history of ancient Egypt. 4. At the same time that the Anglo of Shu were pictured in the tomb chapel. At Beni Hassan, 
a substantial Levantine community was living in the eastern Nile Delta, in dwellings built on the abandoned ruins of a farming settlement established in the times of the Montuoteps. Generations later, another larger Levantine settlement was built on another, half a mile to the east, and other settlements, with cemeteries and temples, were established in the same area on other turtlebacks, so that by the time of the Lassage Toei Kings they had amalgamated to form a conurbation covering some 20 acres. Throughout the following millennium and with the aid of a considerable harbor cut from the banks of one of the many small branches of the Nile Delta, these settlements came to serve as the core of a complex of far larger conglomerations, jigsaw remains that yet lie buried, for the most part, a few feet beneath the straight flat fields of the Delta farmers. This is the archaeological sensation that Egyptologists collectively named, after one of the local villages, Tel El Daba. It has been extensively excavated since 1966 by a team of Austrian archaeologists led by Manfred Bytak. Unlike the settlement of the times of the Montuo Teps at Tel El Daba, which in the usual manner of courtly colonies within the Nile Delta had consisted of modular and modest accommodation set in gridded blocks. The Levantine's houses were often large and generous affairs whose exotic symmetries and proportions had traveled through time and space. From the settlements of the North Levant, where similar designs had served both as houses and as temples and whose origins yet lay at one remove in southern Mesopotamia. Further confirmation of this Remarkable intercontinental exchange was found in a cemetery beside the oldest known Levantine settlement at Tel El Daba, some of whose occupants had been buried with duckbill axes, copper alloy spear points, and all the other accoutrements of so-called Amorite warrior burial. More of those telltale axes, indeed, have been excavated at Tel El Daba than at any other site throughout the ancient East. That the Levantine settlements within the Nile Delta were not Products of aggressive colonization nor even unwelcome immigration was underlined by Biotech's remarkable discovery of the fragments of an over-life-sized statue of a seated man, a skillful product of a courtly pharaonic workshop. This considerable sculpture seems to have been intended to receive offerings, for it was set in an annex close to a tomb, fashioned from a large block of Nile Valley limestone and seated in pharaonic pose. The statue's pudding basin haircut, its yellow painted, scanned in the remains of stripes and squares drawn on its sculpted robes, are all attributes of the images of the Amu of Shu that are pictured in the Beni Hassan tomb chapel, just as the form of the throw sticks carried by the people in that painting, which is also the form of a hieroglyph that denotes the word for several types of foreigner dash had been sculpted, scepter-like across the sculpture's chest. This had been a fine pharaonic. Statue of an honored Levantine. Statues had similarly flanked the doorways of some of the grandest. Burial crypts in the contemporary cemeteries of the North Levant. The graves the Austrian archaeologists excavated from Tel El Daba's onion. Fields, however, were of traditional pharaonic design, with a brick built. Vault set over the corpse in the manner of the desert cemeteries at Abidus. The burials, too were accompanied with offerings held in ceramics of pharaonic design, and the great limestone statue appears to have had a standard pharaonic offering formula engraved in hieroglyphs upon its base. Yet some of the dead within that cemetery had also been equipped with the armory of Levantine warrior burial and were accompanied by pairs of slaughtered donkeys, a custom typical of contemporary interments in the North Levant. Other burials at Tel El Daba held works from other cultures with which the Levantines had been in contact. So whilst the dead in one small cemetery had been laid in typically pharaonic coffins and were accompanied by masses of pharaonic gemstone beads and tableware imported from the North Levant, one grave had also contained a splendid golden pendant designed and made by Minoan craftsmen, and several more held painted pottery made in that same distant culture. These were hardly the burials of bands of nomads from the Levantine deserts, but the graves of a sophisticated cosmopolitan community that, whilst it 
retained its own distinct identity, had prospered in the region of the Lower Nile and adopted many aspects of pharaonic culture. In the broader span of history, such eclectic mixes are characteristic of the Nile Delta's archaeology, despite the pharaoh's ageless title as rulers. Of the lands of the Sedge and the Bee, the Delta's Sedgy marshes were a fluid, somewhat liminal zone well outside the narrow prism of the Nile, valley through which high pharaonic culture was always mediated, a region over inundated during generous Nile floods and subject to penetration by the salt waters of the Mediterranean when the river was running low, yet the delta served both as bread basket and pasture land, for the Memphite and its toey courts, and its ever-shifting streams and mud banks, its luxuriant water meads and pastures, were colonized, exploited and enjoyed throughout millennia by Pharaoh and his agents. So several of the deities housed in the Pharaoh's Delta shrines had. Other shrines at Sarabit, El Khatam, and Sinai and were similarly invoked in. Steely made at the Red Sea port of Wadi Gallusis. And as the courtiers of. Pharaoh had identified the local deity of Biblis, Balat, as Hathor. And those two names appear side by side in different scripts at Sarabit, El Khatam, so Horus, Hathor's son, a falcon god, was similarly identified in. Nile Delta shrines as the falcon deity Sapthu, the sharp one, who is, as, well, a god of foreign lands. The Delta too, was Pharaoh's door to the Levant. Just as Kuzabek's land force had marched out of the Delta and north along the way of Horus, so the vizier Knumhotep's expedition to the Lebanon would have sailed from a Delta port like that at Tel El Daba, the meandering streams of the Nile's dividing branches holding many harbors and access also to the open sea. These would have been the keys from which the Biblis boats had cast off on their voyages to Crete, Cyprus, and the Aegean, and the Levantines at Tel El Daba had probably played a part in these international exchanges, just as Levantine copper workers may well have lent their skills to Pharaoh's workforce since the first days of the kingdom, just as the temple reliefs of the Abu Sir Pharaoh show. Levantine sailors at the steering oars of Pharaoh's seagoing boats, so the very name of Biblis boats may have spoken of their navigator's origins, rather than their port of destination. Austrian archaeologists have estimated that some two million Levantine amphorae, those splendid seagoing ceramic packing cases, were imported into Tel El Daba. Yet that settlement between Pharaoh's Narrow valley in the open sea would serve as more than an entry point for imported goods, for woods, metals and precious oils and incense. Since with them came a wider vision of the world, its ways of life, its craft, its patterns, its workmanship, its architecture, and the effect upon fair on it culture would be profound. Nubian fortresses, in comparison with the Levant, where water came down from the sky and landscape seemed to be an orderless confusion of rivers, hills, and plains. The Nile Valley upstream of Aswan was familiar ground for Pharaoh's courtiers, for Nubia was a leaner version of their homeland. And though lonely and remote, the deserts to the east and west of Nubia were similarly familiar, having been long exploited for metals and hard stone, their unforgiving environment having been overcome to the Extent that pharaonic mining expeditions carried sufficient skins of water to enable them to wash gold from the mother load out in the desert. South of Aswan, the Nile Valley was inhabited by bands of semi-nomadic pastoralists and farmers whose little villages were scattered among spare pockets of river silt. Long before the expeditions of the Memphite courtier Harkuv, pharaonic voyagers had traveled in relative security throughout all those territories and when they had ventured further south and west into the Sahara they had also traveled in relative safety. When that courtly traffic was resumed there is no hint of enmity. And the inscription of Montuotep II that his envoys left on a solitary rock at the Gable Uenat, which simply states that the people of Yam had brought gifts or goods to Pharaoh. At that same time, however, the situation along the Nubian Nile seems to have been different. A graffito scratched upon a rock close to Aswan. Records that a river-based expedition from Montuotep's court, which, 
had traveled 200 miles south of Aswan to the Nile's second cataract, had clashed with indigenous communities along the way, so it appears that access to the exotic produce of the land of the horizon was occasionally threatened by the inhabitants of Lower Nubia, along with access to the fair onyx gold and copper mines. Reaction to this danger finds immediate expression in some of Montuo Tep II's modest temples, where the hapless victims of the classic courtly image of Pharaoh smiting. The enemies of state no longer display the attributes of Levantines but those of the inhabitants of Nubia, that is, people with curly hair, distinctive clothes and gestures, and a skin color far darker than the yellow and red ochres which Pharaoh and craftsmen employ to color. Their images of Levantines and, indeed, those of the male inhabitants of Pharaoh's kingdom. Such growing hostility may have encouraged some Pharaonic expeditions to avoid the river and take to the caravan tracks in the western desert, or even to sail to the south in Biblis boats from the port of Sayu. At all events, the interruptions in court traffic appear to have become more frequent during the following decades, for in the reign of Sen Wizard I, and after twenty years of comings and goings, another somewhat exasperated graffito tells that during one of the vizier and Fokker's many expeditions there had been a violent reaction another contemporary response to such southern insecurities and one of greater consequence was the initiation of the construction of a line of fortresses that in a century and a half had amounted to some seventeen separate citadels set along a 250 mile long stretch of the nubian nile a project that the archaeologist William Adams has described as a chain of the mightiest fortifications ever erected in the ancient world. Some of these impressive mud-brick fortresses were built close to the quarries in the gold mines of the Ijtoi kings and had served as processing plants, as storerooms and protection. The greatest number, however, was clustered in a 30-mile stretch along the desolate region of the Batnel Hagar the belly of stones at the river's second cataract. A huge mass of white water rushing through the toughest and most desolate of deserts, set on the river's banks and on several of its multitude of rocky islands, many of these fortresses were in direct line of sight one to the other. When that had not proved possible, contact between them was maintained, as hundreds of graffiti show, by Watchtowers and observation posts set up and down the line amongst the rocks and cliffs that rise above the river. In all of its previous ancient history, the fair onic court had never built anything remotely like it. Unfortunately, the best part of that extraordinary enterprise now lies beneath Lake Nasser, along with the rest of Lower Nubia. The fortresses. Massive mud brick walls are completely liquefied, and the limestone. Temples that were later built within their courtyards have been dismantled block by block and re-erected nearby or in museums in Egypt and the Sudan. In earlier millennia, however, that imponent procession had dominated the lonely desert valley and had resembled a sequence of alpine castles, though varying widely in their plans, for they accommodated the rugged Nile side terrain, all those fortresses had shared the same. Fundamental design that consisted of an outer wall surrounding a doughty citadel, typically rectangular and ranging along their longest. Sides from 200 feet to more than 1,000 feet, each fortress had contained accommodations for 300 people, large magazines and a small temple, rising to heights of 30 feet and more and standing over deep. Dry moats, their outer walls, which were some 20 and 30 feet thick, had accommodated well-planned archers and braziers, and elaborate bastions were set along their sides and at their corners. Colossal gateways lay at the center of the longest walls, which opened to both the desert and the riverside, where defensive corridors contrived to enable the garrison's continuous access to water. One fortress, at least, is thought to have had a drawbridge. In short, those buildings had held most of the elements that Champollion and his contemporaries would have considered fundamental for surviving a considerable siege, appropriate constructions, it would appear, for a line of kings, one of whose names, Senwazrit, was awarded to a great warrior pharaoh of classical mythology, 
Cessus trees, whose mighty armies, Herodotus relates. Until their recent drowning, several of these fortresses had been remarkably well preserved by drifted sand, their walls and turrets in better condition than those of many medieval European fortresses. In the 1950s and 1960s, when they were excavated in the scramble to record the archaeology of Lower Nubia before it was engulfed by the rising waters behind the Aswan Dam, they were a revelation. And in the years that followed, the photographs, the plans and paper reconstructions of those commanding buildings were used to illustrate the histories of their times, in which quotations from some of the inscriptions that the Ijdoi court set up in Nubia provided a clear literary motive for such an astonishing architectural invasion. One of these inscriptions, that of a so-called boundary stella, states that it marks the southern border, made, so as, to not allow any Nubian to pass, whilst the text of another that was set up at Sanal, one of the southernmost of the Ijtoi fortresses, similarly declares it to be the most explicit of these texts was engraved in duplicate upon a pair of steely, two huge blocks of pink aswan granite some five and a half feet high, one of which was set up within a little temple in the Samal. Fortress, the other inside a nearby fortress on a rocky outcrop on Ernardi Island. Quoted below in an amended version of Breasted's 1906. Translation, which was a standard text for English-speaking historians. Throughout the best part of the last century, the unpleasant tone set in. Easy seal on the interpretation of the ancient fortresses as a grand act of ancient imperialism. Powerful visual precedent for such statements date back to the earliest times of the Memphi kings, when images of Pharaoh smiting a cowering Levantine had been engraved upon the rocks of Sinai, in words. And images both demonstrate the consequences of disobedience, of upsetting the harmony and balance of the ordered pharaonic universe. There is clear precedent, too, for the fortress's idiosyncratic architecture though no such buildings were erected north of Aswan, and the detail of their architecture is completely alien in the Levant. However, many contemporary Bronze Age fortresses share their design. In Pharaoh's expeditions, of course, had long since visited those powerful four-square buildings, and images of them had been engraved and painted on the walls of temples and tomb chapels since the times of the Memphite kings. The representations of Levantine fortresses that were engraved in some of the temples of Abu Sir are very badly fragmented. Several of those placed in the courtiers' tomb chapels, however, have survived and show small bands of pharaonic militia storming those foreign citadels. Though lively, seemingly even anecdotal in their detail, the substance of these scenes, the lines of attackers, the poses of the fortresses, inhabitants as they are subjected to a hail of arrows and attack from scaffolding and ladders, are but standard images of the craftsmen's repertoire, and neither they nor their accompanying texts hold any Information as to the fortress's sizes or locations. One of the finest surviving examples of the genre was painted in the reign of Montuotep II on a row of columns in a large saf tomb at Deir el Bahari. This tomb was made, so its inscriptions tell, for a certain intef, who had been a royal seal bearer. It stands like a guard beside the great wide causeway leading up to Montuotep's temple, beyond its open courtyard. Amongst its shadowed colonnade and the usual images of farming and the activities of courtly households is a scene of Intef and 23 armed men aboard three boats. The next column shows the same group attacking a Levantine fortress, whilst the scene below shows Intef apparently supervising the removal of the fortress's inhabitants. Five women, a few children and a dozen men. And all those people were the brightly striped and checkered robes and have the yellow skin color that the craftsmen of the times employed to distinguish their subjects as Levantines. In test militia, alternatively, are clad in plain white kilts, whose linen will not take brightly colored natural dyes. His troop includes five dark-skinned Nubian archers, fighting, and with quivers filled with arrows at their feet, these Nubians are identified by tassels and distinctive.
headbands, as are some of their predecessors who had worked as militiamen within the valley of the Lower Nile and who also appear in Inktiffy's Tomb Chapel, as in other scenes of similarly metal forts. The fortress's attackers are shown using a wooden scaffold to scale its walls, from which several of its defenders are shown tumbling down onto the ground. In the spring of 1926, Winlock uncovered grisly evidence of the risk of such encounters just a few hundred yards away from Intef's tomb. When his workers opened the corridor of a modest tomb and found it too, he piled with sixty desiccated corpses of felled militiamen, some of whom still wore their archers' wrist guards and were accompanied by wall-strung bows. None of them had been injured, Winlock notes, in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which is not surprising as there is no evidence of pitch battles being fought in such distant ages. The angle of their wounds, however, was consistent with those that would have been sustained during an attack on the high walls of a fortress. A medical analysis establishing that many of them had been dispatched by blows to the head, the coup de grace inflicted after the victims had been either stunned by heavy objects dropped from on high or shot from above by ebony-tipped arrows, some of which were still stuck in the corpses. A number of those unfortunate combatants had been abandoned for some time, and birds had partly stripped the flesh from their bones. But then, the birds had been scared away, and the bodies from those unrecorded. Encounters had been collected up and an expedition had carried them. Back to Pharaoh's kingdom in the courtly burial grounds of Deir el-Bahari. Recent estimates suggest that those warriors had been entombed. Around 1870 BC, during the reign of Senwazir II. By that time, the Designers of the Levantine fortresses had elaborated their original plans, so that the simple straight-sided fortress type shown in Intef's tomb had developed complicated systems of defense, including steeply angled bases at the bottom of the fortress's walls intended, it would appear, as a protection against battering rams. Such angled walls are also shown in the contemporary siege scenes in tomb chapels at Beni Hassan and in the Fortresses of Nubia, which demonstrates that their builders were well aware of recent developments in Levantine military architecture. In fact, the highly distinctive military architecture had a long pedigree, the origins of which lie, as Aaron Burke has recently established, on the plains of northern Mesopotamia in the time of the first recorded traces of the Amorites, when walls and moats were set round far older settlements. By the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, the confederations of the principalities of both Mesopotamia and the Levant had greatly strengthened and elaborated those older systems of defense. And over the following centuries moats, ramparts and square turrets were developed, along with large fortified gateways, monumental structures with three pairs of stone piers supporting a high barrel vaulted corridor, innovations that had been followed in short order by angled walls, bastions and archers and braziers. Major Levantine principalities built clusters of these idiosyncratic structures, set on ancient trading routes and protecting the leading households of those little states, the largest of them shielded urban centers such as Aleppo, Ashkelon, and Kotna, while smaller settlements. Villages and hamlets situated at strategic locations were similarly provided with substantial fortifications, as outlying elements in integrated systems of defense. So very regular, so coherent and so widespread was this military Levantine architecture that it would appear that the fortresses were all designed by specialized groups of traveling craftsmen. Now, the Ejtoi fortresses of Nubia display exactly that same architecture, the same regularity, the same details of design, the same Unified systems of defense. The similarities are so close, indeed, that, if not Levantine themselves, their designers had perfectly understood how such Levantine fortresses had been designed and built from the efficient deployment of bastions and archers and braziers to the signature three-tiered gateways that gave access to the Nile and the desert. All the foreign elements of Levantine fortress architecture were built according to fair methods of mud-brick construction.
all the fortresses in Nubia were made with mud bricks of large and consistent dimensions. An underlying ancient pharaonic methods of construction had been employed that took account of the fact that, with such enormously thick walls, the fresh made and still slightly soft mud bricks would shift as they hardened, a process that took many years. This fascinating cultural exchange is best seen at the fortress of Buin, whose designers had set the rigorous symmetries of high pharaonic design and craftsmanship within the outlandish architecture of another continent. Presumably, the Ijtoi court had felt itself faced with a situation in Nubia similar to that which they themselves had witnessed in the Levant, and they had reproduced an architecture that had projected security and force within an alien land. Yet the circumstances of the Nubian fortresses were entirely different from those in which the sturdy originals had been developed. Whilst Levantine principalities appear to have expended more of their resources on the construction of their fortresses than on any other architectural project, the Ijtoi court, the greatest single entity within the ancient East, was simultaneously erecting pyramids and temples with great blocks of stone, mud brick, by comparison, was a ubiquitous commodity, whose employment demanded a fraction of the state's resources. Many of the Levantine fortresses, moreover, were erected on the mounds of ancient settlements whose surrounding fields had long supported their inhabitants, who, presumably, had been set to work. Building the new fortifications, the pharaonic fortresses of Nubia, alternatively, were mostly built on virgin ground beside a river in a stony desert, where the local populations of farmers and cattle herders were hardly of sufficient size to undertake the construction work. Nor does it appear remotely possible that those spare populations were planning to gather an alliance and invade the kingdom to the north. Nor, certainly, despite the translations of the pharaonic stele and graffiti, were the fortresses of Nubia designed and built from a pharaonic fear of Immigration. Just as the Levantines who had settled at Tel el Daba had peacefully and successfully assimilated pharaonic culture, so many Nubians had long since worked at the courts of local pharaonic governors and pharaohs, indeed, various communities of Nubians had lived within the fifty mile stretch of the river north of Aswan for several millennia. It should never be imagined, of course, that life in ancient Egypt was as secure as that within a modern state. Records from all periods of pharaonic history tell that both individuals and communities were subjected to threats of violence, like most of humankind throughout its history, the people within pharaoh's domain were vulnerable to all sorts of dangers, just as were the boats and caravans that carried incense, gold, and copper back to the pharaonic court. Certainly, the fortresses of Nubia were established in what the modern military would describe as defensive positions, and the adjectives that form parts of their ancient names dash curving the deserts, repelling the Mege, i.e. the Nubians, subduing, comma, repressing, warding off dash betray similar insecurities. In reality, however, life on the ground in lower Nubia was rather different. There is not the slightest archaeological evidence that those fortresses were attacked. No arrows lodged in the mud brick walls and not a single body bearing marks of violence found inside them. The scanty layer of ash that archaeologists have uncovered in many of their rooms was not evidence of sacking but the product of the burning of their roof beams after the pharaonic garrisons had departed and also the product of cooking fires which, as the remaining pottery testifies, were but during several centuries of later local occupation. By great good fortune, fragments of some of the written correspondence of the garrisons in the Nubian fortress have been recovered from a tomb at Thebes, in much the same manner as the archives of the farmer Hekwanet, and these texts too show that in the times of the later Ijtoi kings, at least, the era of Sen was at Threes. Bombastic Sili, the reality of life in Lower Nubia was rather different. Neither an ancient Egyptian Majino line nor products of imperial megalomania, the fortress's architectural braggadocio had in reality protected grain stores, copper furnaces, 
some installations that washed. Grains of gold from crushed ore. But above all else, the fortresses had served as trading outposts and as imposing caravanserai facilitating. Traffic with the south. Canals were cut beside some of the fortresses so that pharaoh's boats would avoid the dangers of the cataracts in times of inundation. Slipways, too, simple structures of clay and wood that ran for miles through the desert, served the same purpose until the Aswan. Damn, some of those installations remained intact, and they had held the scored marks of the keels of the pharaonic boats that had been dragged along their water-slippery surfaces. So this chain of the mightiest fortifications ever erected in the ancient world had not served as beaux gestes outposts of colonial power, as traditional historians assume, but, as with most old and ancient fortresses, as warehouses and to control and facilitate through traffic. A unique venture in pharaonic history, the fortresses of Nubia were a novel addition to the older systems of court supply, and from the days of the vizier Antifoker, in the reign of Aminibid I, to the times of Sen Wizard III, their construction had continued in an unchanging manner, their creation and their integration in the administrative structures of the Ijtoi court underlined by the unity of the architecture and the information contained within the archive of the garrison surviving dispatches that they had operated directly under. The courtier's control is indicated by the seals of several viziers and other court officials that have been found within the fortresses. Some of these seals also show that the fortress's personnel were drawn from all regions of the kingdom. One such, for example, describes its owner as an overseer of the marshland dwellers, that is, an official from the Nile Delta. There are indications that this great project was successful. The considerable increase in the numbers of the courtiers' inscriptions and Graffiti inscribed upon the granite rocks of the first cataract suggests a growth in traffic south of Aswan. There was something of a boom at Aswan as well, many new buildings being erected on Elephantine Island, along with another cemetery in the nearby cliffs for the local governors, whilst an additional channel was cut beside the cataract which further increased year-round access to Nubia and its distant chain of fortresses. Not surprisingly, the operation of those fortresses had significant effects upon the local populations. Nubians who served as militia in the Pharaonic state and had established households in the Pharaonic manner had long since been designated by the term Meje, that is, as people from a region in the southeastern desert that bore that same name. By the time of Send was at three, however, the fortresses' scribes were describing all of Nubia's various inhabitants the desert dwellers, the cattle herders and the farmers who lived beside the fortresses, as Meje, and in their turn the various communities of Nubia appear to have embraced something of a common identity under that same word. The operation of the fortresses also had considerable effect upon pharaonic government. Never before had that age-old structure administered or provisioned such far-flung outposts on such a scale, nor Indeed had it engaged in grand construction projects, other than the excavation of canals and the erection of pyramids and temples. In earlier times, both central and local government officials had maintained small bodies of militia, often medje, who were controlled by people who are usually entitled, in translation, overseers of soldiers. By the time of Sen Wizard III, however, the administration and supply of the garrisons in Nubia had led to the development of more formal and more complex structures of control, which are reflected in a new range of titles and epithets within the court, in some of which several historians have detected the birth of an ancient Egyptian military. For, at that time, terms that are now commonly translated as regiment, officer, and commander were introduced, and all of them, it would appear, were overseen by the great commander at Ijtoi. Thus are great ancient armies born, though, in reality, the combined population of the Nubian. Garrisons could hardly have amounted to more than a few thousand men. Telling tokens of real-life conditions in lower Nubia in those times are 
The two large, traditionally designed courtly mansions that were erected on two rocky islands at the second cataract, set high above the stream. At the head of their respective islands, they were placed precisely on the four points of the compass, in orientation which suggests that, like the royal pyramids, they may have been built to house the kings themselves. Certainly, their architecture provides sufficient space for the living. Quarters of a courtly household and for the ritual theater of pharaonic. Daily life. Unlike the nearby fortresses, however, those two great mansions had relatively thin walls and no defenses at all. In common with the rhetoric of the Nubian inscriptions, the Nubian fortresses were sophisticated cultural artifacts, however functional. They may appear in reality, their architecture was essentially a facade, imported from a quarrelsome region far away that with the traditional use of imagery and architecture had sought to allay a specific set of anxieties. It had been one thing, after all, to voyage to the land of Pund, or travel in desert caravan to the gable Uenat in order to supply the court of Ijtoi, the center of the universe, with the materials that gave it life and form and full identity, but quite another to permanently control regions outside the ordered world of the pharaonic state. In the 1960s, before Nubia had been entirely flooded in several of the fortresses were under excavation, archaeologists unearthed some caches of pots, dishes and waddles with curses scribbled all over them. They belonged to a highly specific and not uncommon class of objects that had been made since the times of the Memphite pharaohs and were intended to be broken into pieces in acts of atropic execration, in the same manner that dolls representing feared or hated individuals are stuck with pins. The greatest cache of these pharaonic nightmares, a genuinely alternative ancient Egypt to the self-confidence its stone monuments displayed, was found buried outside the largest of the Nubian fortresses, in the scattered landscapes of rock and sand that lie around. Mergissa, a large pit had been dug in hundreds of broken pots and dishes, many of them covered in ink text, had been thrown down into and along with modest models of the things of daily life, animals, birds, boats, bound prisoners, bread molds, bows and arrows, images of heads, limbs, eyes and even miniature copper smelting crucibles, all tossed in together before the assembled mass had been covered as if it were an ancient burial. A short distance away, more objects and more models of bound prisoners with badly damaged heads had been buried. In a shallow pit, further pits nearby contained accretions of melted red wax, the residue, presumably, of ceremonial, and a flint knife next to a human head, probably that of a Nubian whose decapitated body was found buried in a shallow grave a short distance away. Groups of similar objects have been found at Thebes and at Aswan, one that is particularly well known for its good condition and its curses, holds a lengthy list of undesirables which appears to include a son of the vizier Antifokar, who are all insulted along with their mothers, before the scribe takes off on a cautionary tour of all regions bordering the lower Nile, ending with the following imprecation. Similar texts curse bad dreams, evil speech, social strife and all of those people, dead and alive, who might think of plotting, fighting or rebelling against Pharaoh. The same texts were written on the broken Pots and dishes in the caches found next to the Nubian fortresses and also upon the statuettes of bound prisoners which are posed in the manner of a sacrifice, thrust down upon their knees in the age-old way, hands tied behind their backs, their throats exposed. The order of these weird interments show that they were the residue of lengthy and careful processes, whilst the words and imagery they hold resemble some religious texts of later ages, describing the endless daily journey from death to resurrection. So, in the vast wastes of Lower Nubia, a group of scribes and militiamen had commissioned and collected an anciently prescribed set of objects and sat within their fortresses covering them in inky curses. Then they had carried those tangible and concrete images of their fears, along with a bound captive, through the great arched stone-clad gateway into the disturbing landscapes of dark hard rocks and drifted sand and there, with amulets, 
Strung around their necks in the great fortress walls behind them, they had supervised the excavation of a shallow pit in a low rise above the rushing river. Then they smashed the inscribed pottery, burnt the models of their enemies and decapitated their captive with a flint slaughtering knife. And all their fears were thrown down into the pits, and they were covered like a burial in sand.